Commissioner Atkinson, uh, today we start the third part of uh, case study number 18. This is the part of the case study that concerns the uh, Sunshine Coast Church. As I indicated in the opening, that is not the real name of the particular church, but a, um, a non-publication direction has been made by Your Honour with respect to that church, and that's because of certain Queensland legislation which governs um, the I, the revealing of the identity of a victim in uh, child sexual abuse matters in that state. Um, we, there are a number of parties um, who have, as I understand it, been granted leave, but uh, Your Honour uh, may be assisted by um, each of those people identifying who they represent. Yes, thank you. So Mr Kernigan. Good morning, Your Honour. Uh, I've been granted leave in the matter of Dr Ian Lehman, uh, who I anticipate will be called in these proceedings. So I announce my appearance this morning. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kernigan. And Mr O'Brien, you've um, previous, previously made an application for uh, leave, which has been granted. That's so. Um, yes, thank you. With respect to only one, um, no, with respect to percent. ALA, his mother yes. and father, both okay. of whom have pseudonyms, which I need to be assisted. Yes, <laughs> the, um, ALA's mother is ALC and yes. ALA's father is ALD. ALD is about to um, yes. give evidence. Thank so I appear for all three of those parties. Thanks, Mr O'Brien. Yeah, so now I appear for Australian Christian Churches. Chowdhury, thank you. Good morning, Your Honour. Taylor Solicitor. I previously sought and was granted leave to appear on behalf of Christian Peterson. Thank you, Mr Taylor. Thank you. Uh, Your Honour, there's a, I have an application for a further direction not to publish with respect to certain details um, about ALA, who is uh, the victim. Um, in this particular part of the case study. Um, I'll hand up a draft direction. I understand it's been distributed to the parties, or it will be shortly. Thank you. Yes, I'll make that direction, Mr Beckett. Is your honour please? Uh, then there is some um, documentation that um, I wish to tender. There are two tender bundles, one simply referred to as the Sunshine Coast Church Tender Bundle. I tender that first. 18.0025. And a supplementary tender bundle in the same part of this case study. Supplementary bundle being 18.0026. Um, I further tender the statement of Thomas Lew, L E W, made the 17th of November 2011, and I have two copies for Your Honour and Commissioner Atkinson. Thank you. 18.0027. And I have a, a further copy, which is the Sunshine Coast Church Child Abuse Policy, dated 19th of January 2006. And um, I have two copies for Your Honour and Commissioner Atkinson as well. I tend to that. Thank you. 18.0028. I call ALD. Mm. 
Your Honour, just before the, the witness um, gives his evidence, I just note on the transcript the date of the child abuse policy is recorded on the uh, transcript as 19 November. I think council assisting would agree it's 19 January. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. Mr ALD, do you wish to take the oath or the affirmation? Thank you. If you just raise the Bible in your right hand and repeat after me, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. In this royal commission. In this royal commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Thank you. If you just replace the Bible and you can take a seat now, right, right where the chair is. Thank you. Mr ALD, um, as I think you're aware, uh, the Royal Commission has provided you with a certain for today's proceedings, and so I and others will refer to you as Mr ALD. Do you understand that? Thank you, yes. And uh, you've provided your full name to the Royal Commission, that's right? Yes. And uh, you've also provided an address to the Royal Commission? Yes. And you have um, made a statement dated the 13th of October 2014? That's correct. Are there any changes you wish to make to that statement? No, no, no changes to that statement. I... Is it true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. I tender the statement. 18.0029. Um, so you will see a copy of your statement in redacted form come up on the screen. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if you could uh, please read through your statement. Yes. The statement made by me accurately sets out the evidence that I prepared to give the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. The statement is true and correct to the best of my knowledge and belief. The full name is ALD and my date of birth is redacted I am currently employed as redacted. I am the father of ALA. Um, in relation to the Sunshine Coast Church, in about 2000, I moved with my wife and children from Mackay to the Sunshine Coast. When we arrived in redacted, we joined the Sunshine Coast Church. At that time, Ian Lehman was the senior pastor of that church. My children, including my son, ALA, became involved in the youth ministry of Sunshine Coast Church. In about 2003, Jonathan Baldwin came to Redacted. Please continue. Okay, please continue. I'll start that sentence again. In about 2003, Jonathan Baldwin came to Redacted and Mr Lehman introduced him to the Sunshine Coast Church members. I met him at this time. Mr Baldwin subsequently moved to Redacted from South Australia to take up the position of youth pastor with the Sunshine Coast Church. Uh, Mr Baldwin's family also moved to Redacted from South Australia at, the, at, some, time, at some stage. My children continued to participate in the Sunshine Coast Church Youth Ministry Program after Mr Baldwin started working as youth pastor. At that time, we were usually advised of youth ministry activities by public announcement at the church meetings. I was not aware of any child protection policies in place at the Sunshine Coast Church. I had no reason to be aware of them or be concerned about them at that time. The relationship between my son and Jonathan Baldwin. Sometime after Mr Baldwin became youth pastor at the Sunshine Coast Church, I became aware that he had chosen to mentor ALA and to encourage him to take, youth, take on a youth leadership role. At the time, ALA was about 12 or 13 years old. I remember thinking that ALA was perhaps a bit young for youth leadership, but that the mentoring idea had merit. I also recall that ALA's brothers started to feel a bit isolated because of the attention given to ALA. As a result, they withdrew from some of the youth ministry activities. I recall that ALA's involvement with Mr Baldwin increased over time their relationship to be, began to extend beyond church activities. 
I recall that ALA would attend activities with Mr Baldwin and Mr Baldwin's family. These activities included such things as fishing and playing tennis. I also recall that I had some difficult conversations with ALA during this time because I felt that he was spending a lot of time with Mr Baldwin and his family and that our family's activities were taking a back seat as a result. I recall that ALA was fairly unhappy when I raised this. He seemed to want things to remain as they were. At the time, I wondered if this was the beginning of his adolescence and a desire to, to assert his independence. I recall that I was also concerned about Mr Baldwin spending time with ALA to the exclusion of my other children. Mr Baldwin would come to our house to pick up ALA and I recall that Mr Baldwin would never approach or talk to my wife and I. He would just wait outside in the car. At the time, I just put this down to unusual behaviour. ALA's relationship with Mr Baldwin continued until Mr Baldwin moved to the Gold Coast in about 2006. I recall that ALA went to visit Mr Baldwin on the Gold Coast two or three times. ALA always asked their permission before he went. On one occasion, my wife and I were going to the Gold Coast and we took ALA to Mr Baldwin's house on our way. Disclosure of abuse. ALA left Sunshine Coast Church about 2006 and started attending redacted at Kawana Waters. In about 2006, Mr Lehman left Sunshine Coast and Chris Peterson replaced him as the senior pastor. In 2007, I received a call from the pastor of <coughs> redacted, um, John Pierce, who asked to come and see my wife and I. Mr Pierce came to our house the following evening. ALA was also home at that time. I recall that Mr Pierce told my wife and I that ALA had something he wanted to tell us. ALA then told us that he had been abused by Mr Baldwin. The morning after this meeting, I took ALA to redacted police station. The police officer, Teresa Beck, took ALA's statement. I recall thinking she was fantastic. I understand that the police arrested and charged Mr Baldwin that evening. The police also put ALA in touch with a counsellor, um, Sharon Anderson, who was very good and who he saw for a number of years. Overall, I was very impressed with the support and help from the police. Counselling costs were met by the state. I recall a visit to a home from Tom Liu and his wife Sandy one evening in 2009 before the trial. They came expressing their support for us in this difficult time. That evening, as my wife and I recall, Tom indicated that he had also spoken with Ian Lehman regarding some concerns with Baldwin's attentions towards ALA. We also recall at least two other people, Melissa Lockwood and Celeste Village, indicated that they also had concerns with Ian. These ladies both gave testimony at the trial of Baldwin. Uh, criminal proceedings. Almost two years after Mr Baldwin was charged with offences against ALA, and after a committal hearing, he was tried at Redacted Courthouse. During Mr Baldwin's trial, <coughs> ALA gave evidence excuse me, <coughs> uh, from another room. My wife and I did not listen to ALA's evidence at his request. I understand that ALA found the process of giving evidence harrowing. I gave evidence at Mr Baldwin's trial and, the, and at the committal hearing. Mr Baldwin was convicted in 2009 relation to ALA's abuse. I recall thinking that ALA would feel vindicated and happy as a result of this conviction. He was to some extent, but I recall that he was in emotional turmoil at the time and this detracted from any positive feelings he might have had um, from the conviction. The criminal proceedings took several years. The Director of Public Prosecutions, the DPP, handled the case during this time. I recall that they explained some of the delays in the process, however, I do not recall receiving any real explanation for the long delays in the prosecution. I was unhappy with how long this process took. Uh, civil proceedings. In about 2010, ALA engaged a solicitor and commenced civil proceedings. I understand that ALA's lawyers suing Mr Baldwin 
excuse me, I'll start that sentence again. In about 2010, ALA engaged the solicitor and commenced civil proceedings. I understand that ALA's lawyers considered suing Mr Baldwin, but decided that he had insufficient assets. I understand that they then decided to sue the church for negligence. I understand that ALA took this course because he felt that he was entitled to justice and compensation as a result of his abuse and because the church had not been forthcoming. At this time, we were living in West Australia and did not have much involvement with these proceedings. We did, however, go to Brisbane with ALA for the final out-of-court settlement negotiations with the church's insurers and far. The church sent no representative. In about 2000, <coughs> In 12, ALA reached an out-of-court settlement with ANSVAR. I understand that the terms of this settlement were subject to confidentiality clauses. Pastoral care. After ALA told my wife and I of the abuse, we contacted Pastor Chris Peterson, our local pastor. By this time, we had already spoken to the police. Mr Peterson provided good support to my wife and I and ALA when he could. I also told Mr Peterson of my concerns that the church leadership did not want to know about ALA's abuse. I understand he did what he could to speak to Australian Christian Church's hierarchy, but I wasn't privy to these conversations. Our concerns were that the church, from where the abuse originated, wiped the hands of ALA. Even after the trial confirmed the man's guilt, they should have come back to him with support. Um, Ian Lehman's response. I did not hear anything from Mr Lehman after ALA disclosed his abuse. Putting aside Mr Baldwin's relationship with Mr Lehman's daughter, I would have expected some form of contact from Mr Lehman as he was our pastor when ALA was abused by Mr Baldwin. I have subsequently found out from friends that two or three people had spoken to Mr Lehman about their concerns that Baldwin was spending a large amount of time with ALA. I understand that some of these people were referred to DPP and gave <coughs> evidence at ALA's trial. I did not hear this evidence. On 12th of October 2014, I received an email from Melissa Lockwood, who was a youth worker at Sunshine Coast Church. In the email, she set out what she told Mr Lehman about her concerns in relation to ALA and Mr Baldwin. In this email, she also states that Mr Lehman basically disregarded her concerns and that he did nothing about them. The response of Australian Christian churches. Until 2012, I was never formally in contact with the Assemblies of God or the Australian churches. In about 2011, I emailed as many officers of the Australian Christian churches across Australia as I could. I emailed, I emailed everyone whose contact details I could find because I wanted to find out who cared, if anyone cared. I have recently recalled that I did receive a response from someone who worked for Australian Christian Churches in Ipswich. I recall this email questioned whether my email was in fact spam. At the time, I did not take any notice of this email. This was the only official response. since moved to Mackay and have joined the local church. I understand that leadership of our current church are aware of what happened to ALA, however they have never spoken to us about it.
I think it might be better. So if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just read um, the relevant parts of this. Thank you. Given that um, certain matters don't seem to have come forward uh, on the redacted on-screen copy. Um, <clears throat> uh, both during and after the criminal process, ALA was very emotional. We had many sleepless nights and a few times we called an ambulance to, call, to calm him down. It was a very difficult time for us. When he was younger, ALA always wanted to have a certain occupation. I understand that Mr Baldwin told ALA that God wanted him to be a youth pastor and not that certain occupation. ALA stops talking about becoming that occupation. Some years after Mr Baldwin was convicted, my wife and I took ALA on a holiday to the Gold Coast. While we were there, ALA spent a day talking to his cousin who was in that occupation group. I recall they spent the day talking about it. I believe that this helped ALA to get his dream back and he later um, engaged in uh, some occupation related activities. After this, ALA gradually started to, uh, to improve. I believe that he found a reason to look to the future and to start to turn his back on the past. Is that correct? That is correct, thank you. Thank you. Now, so I understand that, that um, you also have um, a, a short um, statement you wish to read. If I may. Yes. Um, I understand you have it on, a, on an iPad or some sort of tablet, tablet yes. with you. Yes. All right. I wonder if you could um, read that, please. I can read that. Thank you. We believe in cases such as being considered today that the church have behaved in a manner completely opposite to that taught by Christ, whom they purport to represent and model. It is our belief that Ian Lehman is completely to blame for allowing this disgusting abuse to happen to our son. When, as the available evidence shows, concerns were brought by, to Ian by several members of our church, we could, he could have stopped it right there. The church, Ian Lehman and the AOG completely and utterly abandoned our son and his entire family through this process. In our opinion, it would have been reasonable perhaps for the church to have been careful with handling the accuser until the courts had completed their judgments. However, once the perpetrator was confirmed as guilty, then the church should have immediately come alongside the victim, offering apologies and appropriate <coughs> support. However, once the perpetrator was found guilty, things became worse. We had to then watch our own son suffer through a long drawn out court process. From the age of 16 through to 21, his pain, suffering, tormenting thoughts and images still run through his head. This he has to live with for the rest of his life. Where was the church and the AOG then? Evidence before the Commission indicates that in fact the church instead worked to minimise potential losses in case ALA should, the victim should seek compensation. Insurance was checked, consideration given to possibly shifting assets to other entities, etc. Further evidence shows that one email I circulated seeking support and challenging the church to treat our son as other victim and other victims as Jesus would have when tabled at one meeting elicited, elicited a comment suggesting that this has potential to cause issues. From the ages 12 through to 21, our son was firstly, firstly sexually abused by a church leader. Then when he called for help, he was shunned, dragged through the courts. Then when the innocent victim shunned again, his church shattered his teen years. Then he was left with a massive legal bill to boot. How much abuse and kicking should a victim of church negligence have to take? The process of this commission and the contents of evidence now available confirms my suspicions that the churches, church clearly prioritises so-called important people, money and assets far above victims of abuse under their watch. The imperative of running a profitable business far surpasses any concern for the pain of anybody hurt along the way. A message from ALA, who couldn't be here today, afraid of the feelings. And emotions. This process would bring up in him, he says, excuse me, <clears throat> the pain 
pain, thoughts and considerable suffering haunts me every day. People say it gets easier with time. No. That's a lie. It never goes away. And doesn't get easier with time. Can I conclude with three questions? What would Jesus, sorry, would Jesus molest a child? Clearly the answer is no. If a child was molested, would Jesus protect that child from further abuse? Obviously, yes. Would he expose the perpetrator? Yes. Would Jesus allow the abuse to continue? No. Then why does the church, those who claim to represent Jesus, do the exact opposite? Are they really demonstrating the character and nature of God or something else? It's now time for a real, open and honest change. It's time to look after the victims if in fact it isn't already too late. Thank you. Mr ALD, I want to take you back to um, 2003-2004. Um, as I understand it, you and your family worshipped at the Sunshine Coast Church. That's correct. In about, at about that time? Yes. And you were already going to that church when Mr Baldwin arrived from South Australia? Yes, we started attending that church in about 2000. And... Um, at that stage, sorry, I'll withdraw that, from the period when you commenced all the way through to 2006, were you ever shown any um, policies that the church had with respect to um, child sexual abuse? No. Um, I'll, have, I'll show you a document. Um, it might be easiest if I show you the hard copy, but if you exhibit 18... 0028 could come up on the screen. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, we've been provided with this, this document um, entitled Child Abuse. And up in the top right-hand corners, um, it does refer to something to do with the Sunshine Coast Church. And then at the bottom, it says created on the 19th of January 2006. Was this a document that was ever shown to you? No, I've never seen it before. All right. Um, during the period 2003 to 2006, did Pastor Lehman ever indicate to you um, or to the congregation that uh, there were such policies in place? Not that I can recall, no. All right. I'll just take you through to um, the 13th page of that document. You'll see it has 13 in the, in the centre at the bottom of the page. It's ringtail 10. C conduct policy there? Yes. Just scroll down, mm. please. Um, and it sets out a number of rules which concern contact with children. You see um, the first dot point, no one is permitted to visit a child alone. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and then the next dot point is not to be in a secluded place with a child. Ah, oh, yes. And if, if they are, then it needs to be in the presence of another leader. Do you see that? Yes. Be careful about placing children on your knee. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, physical contact to be limited. Do you see that? Yes. No kissing of children. I see that. Uh, hugs also require monitoring in situations where appropriate. Yes. And the next dot point, <coughs> not permitted to drive a child home alone. Do you see that? Yes. All right. Were those rules explained to you at any stage between 2003 and 2006 by members of uh, the Sunshine Coast Church? Not to me, no. And does that include Pastor Lehman? Yes. 
Um, were policies freely available at the church for reference by those who um, were members or worshipped at the church? Not that I can recall freely, no. In terms of that sort of activity, was it ever indicated to you, particularly as part of the general congregation, that such behaviour was um, prohibited at Sunshine Coast Church? No, these behaviours were never raised in any form to us. Thank you. Um, now, as I understand it, um, all of your children, I think you have three children, is that right? Three sons, yes. And they were all involved in, in the youth activities at the church? Two more than the oldest, but all three, all three attended with us, and the younger two played in the instruments in the band. And is ALA the, the oldest of your three children? He's the youngest. He's the youngest? Yes. All right. And um, um, Pastor Baldwin, or Mr Baldwin, arrived in 2003. And what did you notice about his interaction with, um, uh, with your children? Initially, I didn't notice much, but very Early in the stage, Mr Baldwin started to take considerable interest in, in, in ALA. How did, how did that um, manifest itself? ALA was very competent with his musical instrument and it was manifested as some form of encouraging him in developing that and then gradually moved into suggestions of training for youth leadership. All right, so it was, as youth pastor, he was involved in, in musical activities at the church? Yes. And um, were the activities located at the church or outside the church, or what was that process? Predominantly at the church, but then later a different venue was hired for outreach activities to youth at the high school, and they would set up the band there and, and um, had the activities then pack away and go back, take all the equipment back to the church. And in your experience attending the church, um, am I right in saying that Pastor Layman was effectively there generally guiding activities that were occurring at the church? At the church, but not at uh, youth activities. Yes, I'll ask you about the, the, that in a moment. So youth activities at the church were guided by Mr Baldwin, were they? Yes. Was, Mr. Did, was Pastor Layman in attendance during some or those to your knowledge? To my knowledge, predominantly he wouldn't he wouldn't have been, but I wasn't there myself, so I can't All right. say that categorically. And then when the uh, when activities shifted to uh, the second location you referred to, mm. do you recall seeing Pastor Layman there? No. Do you recall seeing Mr. Baldwin there? Yes. Are you aware of who was who was effectively supervising and operating the facility there? My the my awareness and understanding was that Mr. Baldwin was supervising and operating all the youth activities with right. others assisting. And um, in that period <clears throat> from when Mr Baldwin commenced through to when he left um, at the end of 2005, can you please in, you know, indicate what sort of interaction did you see yourself between Mr Baldwin and your son? The interaction we observed was mostly um, encouragement and uh, support and assistance with church activities. Um, often, however, with a big emphasis on encouraging him and not so much on others, uh, least of all his brothers. Um, so there was a lot of focus and attention brought to ALA in all sorts of activities. Um, which we observed and other people observed and felt was a little bit unreasonable in terms of there were other young people involved as well who deserved attention. You thought there was a degree of favouritism, Paige? Absolutely. Yourself. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Was he physically, was Mr Baldwin physically close with your son on those occasions that you saw them together? Possibly not unreasonably so in, in the public forum. Um, and that's... For example, church services and activities where we would have witnessed them or anything. Um, you say not unreasonably. So, can you describe the nature of that physical contact? 
So the reason I, the reason I asked that, sir, is that obviously the, one of the things that the Royal Commission is uh, is inquiring into is the, whether it is appropriate or what the level mm. of physical contact between somebody in authority, such as Pastor Baldwin, and um, a young person. Um, uh, what level of physical contact is uh, appropriate? Well, um, in in those in the forum that, that we were involved as well, which is generally public services on a Sunday, where adults and youth are all there. Um, often he would an arm around his shoulder, and often there'd be an embrace. Um, possibly not much more than that that I can recall in that public forum. All right. And what about when you saw him at musical events that the church had? <clears throat> didn't attend too many musical events because they tended to be of music that the young people enjoy that we don't tend to enjoy. But um, in that forum, um, they were each playing musical instruments in a separate location, so there wasn't a lot of contact there. But before and after was probably as I described a moment ago. All right. Um, now, we, there's some evidence that's been tendered this morning about uh, an, an occasion where... There was, I think, a church sleepover mm. in 2004. Are you aware of that? I am aware of it now. I wasn't particularly aware of it at the time. All right. But um, in 2004, was it common for your son to go to the church for sleepovers of one sort or another? That type of activity wasn't what you'd say common, but it did happen from time to time where the whole youth group would either have a sleepover there or, or perhaps go camping somewhere as a group. All right, and, uh, and that, that, that was under Mr Baldwin's guidance? Yes. So from time to time that type of overnight activity would take place. So it did didn't strike us as particularly unusual, the event. All right. Did other adults or leaders of the church accompany uh, Mr Baldwin with help to help with supervision? That is my understanding, yes. Um, all right. Now, I understand that... Um, to your knowledge, there was a high degree of interaction, I might call it that, between Mr Baldwin and your son, yes. apart from those occasions. Yes. Were there occasions outside of the church where there was some sort of association between the two of them? Quite, quite a lot, yes. What, what sort of activity? As I said in my statement, there were many times when our son would come to us with a request to spend, you know, to go for an evening or a weekend or whatnot with Mr Baldwin, uh, normally at his family's home, or uh, this is what we were being told, um, or at some activity they may go off and play tennis or go to various activities which on the surface were acceptable to us. And we were happy to give permission in the early stages until it became too much. All right. Um, so, first of all, did that occur before Mr Baldwin went to the Gold Coast in yes. Uh, 2006? Yes. Um, and was your son staying over at Mr Baldwin's house in that early yes. period? Um, and um, are you aware as to whether Pastor Lehman was uh, knew about um, that level of contact between Mr Baldwin and your son? I'm not aware of Mr Lehman's understanding or knowledge of that. Did you speak to Mr to Pastor Lehman about those issues? No, because they weren't at that point alarming us. Yes. They were concerning us at their frequency and, and the um, apparent preference to spend time with other people and not his own family. But they hadn't alarmed us to a point of speaking to anybody in the church about it at that point. But then it reached a stage where you were concerned about the, the level of closeness between Mr Baldwin and your son. What we were concerned about was that and the emphasis and focus on him uh, to the exclusion of his other brothers who were also around at the time and involved, um, the frequency of the activities and those were the things that concerned us but the period of time came which I think you have documented there when Mr Baldwin moved on to the Gold Coast and at that point we thought, okay, this will stop now. So, but it didn't? Well, it didn't, no. Um, and so there were a number of visits to his 
house in the Gold Coast, is that right? Or? Yes, not many. I think probably only two or three by memory, but I could be stand corrected. Yeah. And as I indicated earlier, um, one of those activities, um, we were actually on the coast, so he came with us. And so it, I guess it indicated at that point we were still, to some extent, trusting this man. And um, um, after he moved to the Gold Coast, were you, did you have any contact with um, Pastor Lehman or um, his successor, Pastor Peterson, about um, your son going to the Gold Coast? No, none significant that I can recall. All right. Now, um, you were informed by your son about the abuse in April of 2006, I think is the most accurate that we can... Um, Yes, we have a, um, a police statement from John Pearce, who was a pastor for your son at another church, yes. and he indicates that um, the matter was in... He was told of the matter by uh, your son in on the 4th of <coughs> April 2007. Does that sound right? That would sound right, yes. And... I think uh, in terms of the way the chronology goes, he didn't tell you immediately, but he did provide more details of the abuse to Mr Pearce uh, on the 16th of May. And then did your son come to you to disclose the abuse first or was it uh, the pastor who raised it with you? Pastor Pearce. And it was not long after that that he spoke with um, Pastor Pierce. And um, Pastor Lehman had also left um, the Sunshine Coast Church. Um, I believe that was about then, yes. He was, yes. He was nowhere around. Nowhere around. Um, <clears throat> by May of 2007, you were still worshipping at the Sunshine Coast Church? Yes. And you'd formed a relationship with the new pastor, Pastor Peterson. Yes. Um, and your son had, he was at another church, mm -hmm. uh, which we don't need to name, but that's where Pastor Pierce was um, yes. working from. And, all right. So, now we know that um, past, uh, uh, sorry, that uh, Mr. Baldwin was charged the next day after you after you, you informed the police of the allegations. Um, what assistance did you receive from Pastor Peterson or anyone anyone else from the church at that stage?
reminded that um, um, if you can uh, uh, try to use ALA's um, pseudonym rather than his first name, Sorry, that would assist. Now it's been stopped at the uh, um, at the web stream level, so it won't have made it outside of this. Uh, Thank you. This hearing room. Thank you. Um, So if I can just talk about that period between the charge and the trial, it's a period of about two, two and a half years. It was a long period, yes. Yes. And uh, we know that the trial is was heard in... Um, I think it commenced in about October, and in any event, he was sentenced in March of 2009. Mm -hmm. um, so in that period there, was there any contact made by... Um, the Assemblies of God um, with you about the um, the allegations that have been made? No. Um, did Pastor Peterson indicate to you that um, some sort of contact would be made by them? Not that I recall. Um, do you recall him trying to uh, contact the the State Executive the, uh, of the Assemblies of God um, to have them involved in the matter? I think I had requested something like that, yes. And, and I believe he would have tried to do that for us. All right, well, we will ask him later today. Um, in, now, um, Were you uh, given any information by Pastor Peterson or indeed by anybody else about what the process was for um, a youth pastor or anybody with a credential, um, what the discipline process was within the Assemblies of God? We were advised that the credentials would be removed immediately if the charges were laid. Who told you that? Well, I believe it would have been Pastor Peterson because he was probably the only one we were really in touch with at that point. Right. Were you aware that even though the charges were laid in May of 2007, his credential was not removed until um, um, the 6th of December 2007? No, I wasn't aware of that. Um, uh, We've received uh, some information in other documentation that there was a degree of uh, resentment within the within the Sunshine Coast Church congregation towards your son because of the allegations. Are you able to assist us with that at all? The experience my son had, and I think we as parents had as well, was that once the allegations were known, and I. I believe it's because the nature of the crime is unseen. It's not like somebody's physically cut or anything. It's an unseen crime. People can't see and didn't see what happened and have to make up their own mind. And so very, in a very real way, we felt the congregation divided and we had folk who stood by us and stood by our ALA um, and other folk who chose not to communicate with us anymore who had been... Um, comfortable with us up until that point. Um, now, you're saying, using the word they, as I understand it, ALA was not attending the um, Sunshine Coast Church, is that right? That's correct. Um, so w was that um, antipathy or opposition to what he had done ever expressed to him directly, to your knowledge? I don't have clear recollection of that. But... You recall um, people at the congregation at the Sunshine Coast Church as um, expressing their feelings about that to you? The only way feeling, feelings were clearly expressed was by um, silence. Folk who we'd had ongoing friendships and relationships with for years stepped back and didn't communicate anymore. And others stepped up and said, we're supporting you. Was there ever anything said by Pastor Peterson on a, on a Sunday at a service or any message communicated to the members of the church as to ways in which they should um, respond to these allegations? Not that I recall, no. 
Do you think it would have assisted if there had been some greater level of communication about ways in which to handle um, the, the charges and the criminal process? I'm not sure if it would have assisted or not. Um, Mr Baldwin is a very charismatic personality and, and had established friendships with a lot of people. And so I think a lot of people chose not to communicate with us because they didn't know who was telling the truth and who wasn't. So I guess they were waiting to see what transpired. All right. Now, during the, the criminal process, the criminal trial, where your son gave evidence, I understand, were you provided with some form of support by the church or by the Assemblies of God during that period? Once again, um, Pastor Chris and his wife supported us as best they could. Um, other than that, the church were silent. All right. Did, they, did uh, Pastor Peterson come along with you to the to the courthouse where the trial was happening? Um, I know his wife did, and I think he did as well. But I. All right. I, now. I, I know they supported us definitely in that, at that time as best they could. Now I understand after after the. After Mr Baldwin was convicted, you wrote uh, an email to Mr Peterson. It'll come up on the screen. Tender bundle 10, please. And um, we'll see about 12 lines down. There are two square boxes and it says... Sorry, first of all, is this the email you wrote to Pastor Peterson? On the 7th of May 2009? Yes. Um, just returning to that part, the two square boxes about 12 lines down. One component of the process you may be able to assist with is the deafening silence from the AOG. I see, and further down, I see this as a significant lack of duty of care from leadership both here at the time as well as those who supported them. So that's what you wrote. Mm. And then if we go to about... Um, Three quarters of the way down, there's a sentence that reads, have AOG any processes in place to address these matters or do they just duck for cover and hope it will go away? Mm. Do I take it from that that you didn't understand that there, were, that there may have been processes in place for dealing That's with correct. these matters? Yes. And what were you expecting from the AOG um, to have occurred? As I said in my other statement, I was expecting that once... The confusion about the allegations was clarified by the courts, then an organisation such as the church would then take the position that we have a victim here that we need to support. We have someone here who's been injured severely um, by what's happened. And I would have expected from at least the local, if not the highest level, preferably the highest level, the organisation should have come cap in hand to that young boy and um, we're terribly sorry, what can we do? It was the type of response I was expecting from an organisation that is supposedly a Christian organisation. All right, now, um, what response did you get from the as Assemblies of God as a result of sending this letter? From the Assemblies of God, nothing. Yes. Um, I should be. I, I should uh, make note that by this stage, the Assemblies of God became known as the Australian Christian Churches. Mm -hmm. In fact, it changed name in 2007. So um, does your same answer apply to the Australian Christian Churches? Yes. Um, are you aware of what uh, Pastor Peterson did, if anything, as a result of this email? Not clearly. Um, right. But in essence, the, you uh, you didn't receive any further communication from the AOG, certainly not in 2009 or 2010, is that no, right? No, no further communication from the organisation. I think in May of 2010, um, your son, ALA, had commenced the process with some lawyers of seeking compensation from the church. Yes. And um, at that stage, you yourself didn't hear anything from um, from the 
ACC? Not that I ever recall, no. All right. And then I think in October of 2011, you wrote a further email to a large number of people, is that right? That's correct. Um, if Tender Bundle 15 could come up, please. Sorry, I apologise, I have the wrong... Excuse me. Yes, Tender Bundle 17. Sorry, I've just there are a number of versions of this document. I think I just want to show you the, the correct one. Thirteen. There, so right. um, I might bring up the copy at uh, tender bundle thirteen. So the copies are scattered throughout the tender bundle, but this is the first time that it occurs. We just scroll down to the bottom of the, the first page. Scroll down to where it says from ALD. Keep going. All right. In any event, um, first of all, Mr. ALD, you'll see that this is the start of an email that you sent to a, a large number of people on 11th of October 2011. Yes. And um, why was it that you sent um, this email about a cry from a father's heart for his son? Why did you send this? First of all, that that is one occasion that I sent that email. I think I sent that, that email on two or three each time to a, an extended list of email addresses as I found them, so it was the same email. But the reason I sent it was I have a, ha, had a son who had been proven innocent and was still tearing his heart out and still deafening silence from the organisation. All right. And the organisation, you mean the ACC? ACC in that event, yes. Yes, all right. I'll just go to Tender Bundle 17, where that email is set out. If we could just go to the, the, sorry, if we scroll down, we'll see that uh, the email with a large number of people who it was sent to. Is that right? Yes. Yes, uh, and that included people from the um, the ACC. Where I could find email addresses. Yes. Yes. All right. And if we just go over the page. where you explain the, the position of what happened with your son. Mm. And then if we scroll down further, we'll see where it says, Jesus said, suffer the little ones to come unto me. Mm -hmm. You say, we brought our little ones to him and now our youngest suffers and suffers and suffers. Is that right? That's correct. And so it's a reference to what had happened to your son yes. and the effect on him of, uh, of the legal process, first of all? Well, the abuse, first of all, and the legal process subsequently. Um, and that included the, um, the process of obtaining compensation, is that right? The process of trying to well, obtain yeah. compensation, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the timing there, but... 
All right. It says, as, as he seeks some form of compensation for all he has and continues to suffer. Okay. Yes. Is that right? That would put it in that time frame, yes. And then you say, in all of this, where is the church organisation, the AAG, that allowed this man to do what he did? Did you see, you see yes. that? So at that stage, you consider the AAG to have um, a, a degree of responsibility for what had happened to your son. Absolutely. And um, you thought that there should be some response from the AAG yes. because of the criminal conviction. Yes. And uh, do I take it that between the time of the conviction and this email that you had not received any such... Um, no such communication response. at all. Excuse me? Okay, thank you. So I've just picked that up from the transcript. Um, and then you make some remarks there about uh, the insurance company let things matter, let matters drag by while they do their thing, you say. So there were concerns about the delay in the in the claim process, is that right? That is correct, yes. And then at the end, it says, can you hear my heart? Can you imagine my wife's tears? Can you help? Yeah. Right. Correct. Now, what response did you get to this email from the ACC? I have to say, until recently, I thought I got no response. But in fact, when I was prompted by some of the evidence presented, I did in fact receive an email from um, a church secretary based in Ipswich. You may have that somewhere. Um, the email was very short and it made some reference to, is this email a spam? Yes, I'll, I'll have that brought up. It's Tender Bundle 13. It's, uh... At the time of receiving that email, um, I had also received possibly three or four encouraging encouraging emails from folk I didn't know who, who felt that what I was saying needed encouraging. I also received a couple of emails from, shall I just say, crazy people. And I received this one in the midst of all that, and when it said something, is this email spam? I thought, who's this? And disregarded it. All right. It was a very odd email, so I didn't recognise at the time that it was anything official. Now, um, the material that we have, certainly um, um, a statement provided by Mr Svensson from the State Executive of the ACC, seems to indicate that by March 2012 you hadn't received any formal response from the ACC okay. and that your wife, in fact, had taken up the matter with uh, 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 Pastor Wayne Alcorn at the national level. Apparently, yes. And... Then I think it was by July 2012 that um, uh, uh, Mr Svensson made contact with, with you, is that right? Yes. By that stage you were living in Western Australia? Yes. All right. Prior to him contacting you, so in the period between this email, the, the email of the 11th of October 2011, and um, him making contact in July 2012, did you have any contact with the, from the ACC about your email? Other than this um, email that's on the screen, no. Um, and then Mr Svensson, then I think he, he flew to uh, see you and met with you? He flew to Broome and met with us, yes. And met with ALA as well at the yes. same time? Yes. All right. Um, and I think you've addressed that in your statement, but I think you used the words too little, too late. By then that's how we were feeling, yes. Yes. Um, I just to summarise, how did you feel by 2012 um, about the way the, um, the Assemblies of God, also known as Australian Christian Churches, had handled your complaint? Really quite disappointed and, and confused. Um, it, it was not the uh, result I would have expected, as I've said earlier. Right, thank you. Yes, those are my questions. Thanks, Mr Beckett. 
Your Honour, I wonder if I might go yes. in a little while, just because I have to seek some instructions from my client about something that yes. the, the witness has just given, if that's convenient. Yes. Thank you. Mr O'Brien. Thanks, Your Honour. Uh, Mr ALD, uh, as you know, I represent you and your son and your wife. Yes. And my name is O'Brien, for those listening remotely. Um, Baldwin was convicted uh, by a jury of 12 in the Maroochydore District Court in April of 2009. Is that right? Yes. And. Your son ALA's case against the church through their insurer was uh, settled by mediation uh, in 2012. Yes. And I think it was around about August of 2012, is that right? I, I think so, yes. And as I understand it, it was fairly shortly after the conviction of Baldwin that the civil proceedings commenced by ALA, right? Yes, I don't think it was very long. And he hired a, a, a team of lawyers at a Gold Coast law firm to assist him? That's correct. And the process, the fact that it took that period of time between the filing shortly after the conviction up till the mediated settlement in the latter part of 2012 seems to indicate that there was some resistance on the part of the church to, uh, to come to a settlement and agree as to how this thing might be properly compensated. Uh, I object to that. I don't know if this witness can answer. Yes. Well, if I suggested to you there was some reluctance in coming to the party in compensating your son fairly um, in that process, would you agree with that proposition? Well, again, I object. Uh, I don't believe this witness was part of those proceedings. And it should be made clear at this stage that the insurer was for the local church. It was not the insurer for Australian Christian churches. That needs to be... Uh, realised. Well, I haven't said anything contrary to the last proposition, and in relation to the first, that he wasn't a party to the proceedings, well, I'd ask the, the council to have a look at tab 41. He was parcel. He, not only was he party to the proceedings, he was there and present at the mediated negotiations. So um, I reject both of those propositions in the opposition to the, to the question. Mr ALD can... Um, respond to the question on the basis of r rather a, not not a general sense, but rather what his um, what his observations were, Mr. O'Brien, of well, quite uh, so. what what his involvement was and his observations were with respect to the proposition well, that you're putting. Thanks, Sean, and I'll clarify that then. Now, now as I understand it, okay. your wife and yourself were significantly involved um, in the prosecution of the civil case against the church? Yes. Is that right? Yes. Um, because at that stage, ALA was, well, he was only in his early 20s, wasn't he? I think he may, yes, late teens, early 20s, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and so you took an active interest, uh, yes. as did your wife, in how ALA civil proceedings were going? Definitely. And when the matter finally did come to mediation on the 20th of April 2012, it was the case that you were there. Yes. In support of Yes. And as too was your wife. Yes. And, um, and of course, ALA was there too. That's correct. And so I ask again, did you come to be aware 
of the fact that there was resistance from the church in their willingness to properly compensate at an early stage. That was certainly the feeling we got. And one of the things that was apparent to you was that the church were not accepting responsibility for what Baldwin did to ALA. Isn't that right? Yes. And one of the ways that they shirked their responsibility for what Baldwin did to your son was that they denied that they had any knowledge that Baldwin was this type of predator. I understand that was the case, yes. And in particular, they denied that the senior pastor of the church, Mr Lehman, had any knowledge of what was happening. I understand that was the case, yes. And they denied that he had ever been told Mm. anything which might arise, arouse his suspicions. That's my understanding, yes. It wasn't told to me, but I understand from what I've heard since, yes. Uh, so, uh, if the church... Uh, your understanding of pres- the, the, the mediation is that, 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 that is precisely what counsel for the church said. Lehman didn't know. He couldn't have known. He did his best, but wasn't suspicious. That's the effect of what counsel for the church said at the mediated proceedings, isn't it? I understand that, yes. I want to to take you to uh, tab 41, if that can be displayed on the screen, please. I don't know if you've seen this document, um, Miss ALD, or not. Um, no. You'll, you'll, take it, you'll take it from me. This, this document is a, a letter from the church's solicitors to the church's insurer. Mm-hmm. And... It stated the, the 27th of April 2012 and it accounts to the insurers as to what happened at the mediated uh, conference, the mediation conference that you attended. And if you scroll down, please, Madam Officer. You'll see the claimant um, portion of that, uh, the attendees includes your son ALA, your wife ALC, and yourself ALD, mm-hmm. as long as well as your your son's uh, lawyers, yes, and counsel. And as I understand it from this document, the, the way the media, mediation proceeded was not uncommon to to most mediations that the claimant ALA. His lawyers put their case, yes, and the respondent, the church's counsel, uh, responded as to what their case would be. Mm. And if we go down further, there, as you set out in your statement, Mr. Myers, who is um, ALA's lawyer, put. The proposition generally, this might hopefully refresh your memory of this event, put the proposition generally that Lehman should have known about Baldwin's activities earlier. Is that right? Yes. Do you remember that happening in the, in the mediation? There was a lot happened that day and it was a little while ago, so this is reminding me, but no, I initially didn't remember that. Do you remember what their response was? What the counsel for the other side said in, in, in broad compass? Can you recall without knowing, or without telling us exact words, obviously, what was their general response to that at this mediation in 2012? I'm sorry, I, I don't clearly remember that one. 
perhaps hopefully I can assist you with this, this document. If we go down to page three. Let's say just scroll down please. Mr. Wayne. Mr. Mr. Wayne it appears was the counsel for the, the church. And um, he put the the contrary case, the case of the, the church against your son. Remember that happening? Can I ask if Mr. Wayne was present or on the telephone? Well, I have no idea. No, I Apparently don't... he was present according to this document. I don't remember his name. I know they were making telephone calls a lot. Do you remember someone enunciating the, the case of the church against your son? Yes. Yeah. This appears to be the person who did that. And that what... Um, they say at the third last dot point from the bottom, so we'll scroll down, please. There it is there. The church could not be held responsible, liable, for the criminal actions of someone such as Baldwin outside of the hours of employment with the church. I do recall that, yes. So ALA was there? Yes. At that meeting? Yes. And the lawyer for the church told you and him and your wife that? Yes. How did you feel? Not happy. Why? The activities at which the abuse took place were church-based activities, be they on property, on off property, during business hours or outside of hours. <clears throat> And so I'm not sure how they define hours of employment with the church. And did you understand that at the time to be consistent with their defence? We're not responsible for Baldwin's criminal activities. Yes. And did you understand that to be a summation, at least in part, of their defence, the defence that they were going to agitate in court if necessary against your son's claim? My understanding was that by, by denying responsibility for him, they would minimise their losses and the, consistently that line came across that they would deny responsibility for his actions. So your son at this stage in his life had, had left high school. Yes. He had ventured out <coughs> and was beginning a career. Mm -hmm. um, he was in the very formative stages of that yes. career development. And it's fair to say um, it was a pretty pivotal time in his career development. Extremely. He was very anxious, according to these documents about his career development and the impact that this particular process might have in his career development? Yes. And, uh, of course, uh, he was uh, still suffering immeasurably from what Baldwin had done to him. Mm, that's correct. Ultimately, these proceedings did lead to a, a negotiated outcome. They did. And it's fair to say from where ALA started and where ALA ended at the end of the day in terms of the negotiated outcome that he compromised significantly. Is that, yes. is that fair? Yes. He's, he was a young man suffering greatly and under a lot of pressure and very much felt pushed into a corner. And as with his parents, we are not familiar with these processes and, and exactly how to manoeuvre through them. Um, our council we had assisted greatly, but um, it was a very confronting and difficult day. And um, by the end of it, I think ALA was just totally bewildered and confused and in a corner not knowing what to do. And, and the... Church's insurers, I think, probably 
realised that and felt that they weren't going to go any further because they'd pushed far enough and he would take what was on the table. And ALA and yourself would have known that by that stage that Lehman was going to feature prominently in the defence case against, uh, against, your, uh, against ALA's civil claim. At that stage, I, I don't think we were sure who we were dealing with. As far as we could see, and certainly by the um, attendance on that day, all we were dealing with was an insurance company. But in terms of witnesses to the, to, the, to the court case and who might be brought out as witnesses on your side and who might be brought out as witnesses on, on okay. theirs, it was fair to say that you knew from this process, if you didn't know it before, that Lehman was going to be in the defence in the defence camp. Yes, definitely. And I'll take you up a couple of points here, please, Madam Officer. There's a dot point that begins youth group activities. See that dot point reading, youth group activities were approved and overseen by Pastor Lehman, who was well aware of the necessary safety considerations for young people. Ms Wayne noted, pastoral care often occurs on a one-on-one -on -one basis and therefore there was nothing unusual about the meetings between Baldwin and the, and the claimant, particularly when Baldwin was mentor for aspiring youth group leaders such as the complainant, uh, such as the claimant. See that? Yes. So, did you understand that to mean that Lehman was saying there was nothing brought to my attention, there were no suspicions that I was aware of? Had there been suspicions, that wouldn't have been said, surely. Right. During your preparation for these proceedings and your discussion, discussion with um, investigative officers from the Royal Commission, you've uh, come to speak to a number of people about what they recall telling yes. Pastor Lehman. Yes. And you referred to that to them um, in your statement that I think Paragraphs 25 and 26, we recalled a home visit from Tom Liu yes. after, after um, it's not the time, but uh, uh, after, um, after Baldwin's conviction and um, Prior to, prior to the civil proceedings commencing. Hmm. Are you aware whether Paul... Uh, so, so you took it from that conversation, did you, that, that Lou had raised concerns about Baldwin to Lehman? Yes. Um, and that was early in, early in the piece? early in the relationship between uh, Baldwin and ALA? That he'd raised the concerns. Timing, I'm not sure, but he's, he certainly told us he had raised concerns, yes. D did he raise them in relation to any particular event or it, was it a general concern he, that he had? It was, he only expressed it to us as general. He didn't go into specifics. Is it a clean time now? Please, Ron. How much well, longer are you going to be, Mr O'Brien? Um, a, a fair bit longer, maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Oh, right. we'll, we'll, we'll take the break now. So um, I'm not sure if anyone's made you aware about this or not, Mr ALD, but there's an, <coughs> an, a regular mid-morning break that's taken mm. um, for everyone's comfort, so yes. we're about to do that now. Thank you.
Your Honour, a matter has arisen with respect to a particular document. Um, I think it's easiest that um, I tender this. It's a letter from Melissa Maines to whom it may concern, dated 12th of October 2014. Uh, Mr O'Brien has seen a copy and Mr Koenigan, whose client it affects, has been also shown a copy. Um, I tender the letter of the 12th of October 2014. 18.0030. Yes, I understand Mr O'Brien will continue. Thanks, Speaker. So I was asking you uh, before the break, um, Mr. ALD, about um, Tom Liu. And uh, I wondered if you could tell um, Arana and the Commissioner what uh, was the role that Tom Liu held in the church at, as of April 2004? My understanding is he was church secretary. Um, I, to be honest, didn't take a whole lot of notice of titles, but Tom was certainly a significant member of the board of the church all the years we were involved. So he was a member of the Board of Governance of the Church? Yes. Okay. And was Pastor Lehman at that stage a member of the Board of Governance of the Church as well? As far as I know, yes. Now, can we have exhibit 18.0027? Display, please. That's the statement of Tom Thomas Liu. This statement, Mr. ALD, is dated the seventeenth of November, two thousand and eleven, um, and. Reports to say that he, Thomas James Liu, is a, at that stage, was at that stage an elder and member of the board at the Sunshine Coast Church. Do, do you know if that had changed since 2004? Not to my knowledge, no. If we can go down to... Ringtail 2. And I'd like to have a look at that paragraph there. Around April 2004, the people, the young people at the church held a youth event where young people slept overnight at the church. After inquiring how the event went, I was advised by Melissa Lockwood that Jonathan had been in his office with ALA with the door locked. Now, <coughs> Lou then goes on to say that in the next paragraph, if we can scroll down, that he, sp he spoke to Jonathan Baldwin. You see that? Yes. And then the following paragraph, I noticed times where Jonathan and ALA would give each other shoulder massage, etc. Lou says in this statement that he recalls speaking with past, Pastor Ian Lehman about his concerns. Did Lehman or Lou ever speak to you or your wife about this? At no time.
So until you saw this statement, would, where have you seen this statement before, incidentally? No, I haven't read this statement before, no. Right. When was it that you were first notified of the events in April of 2004 involving ALA and Baldwin behind the locked door of Baldwin's office at a, at a youth group sleepover? The first we knew of this occurring was after Andrew had given his statement to the police and sometime after that, I'm not sure just how long, um, folk who we knew And indeed, that the church had no corporate knowledge of what Baldwin may have been up to. Apparently. And no suspicions had been aroused. Other than these statements, as such as Tom has made here, um, perhaps the, the uh, feeling was what they were observing may have been inappropriate, whether they suspected anything more or not. As a parent of a child where this activity had occurred, would you expect to know? Yes. Be told? Absolutely. Tab 34 can be shown. This is um, Melissa Lockwood's statement to the police, to the Queensland police in relation to the prosecution of Baldwin. Do you recognise it? I hadn't seen it myself before, but I was, was aware, I was aware of its existence, yes. And, and you knew generally of its contents? Yes. We can go to the, the, the second page of the state ring tail 188 and focus on paragraph 15. This portion of the statement, Lockwood is telling police about this incident at the church sleepover. <coughs> Do you understand that? Yes. And in paragraph 15, she describes coming to the locked door of <coughs> Baldwin's office. Do you see that? Yes. And she says to the police at paragraph 15, it took longer than usual for the door to be opened, but when it was opened, I noticed that ALA was in the office wearing his boxer shorts with no shirt on. I was so shocked in seeing ALA in Johnny's office Johnny's office with his boxer shorts. You see that? Yes. Were you or your wife ever told about this incident by the church or anyone else not, prior to this? Not until after Baldwin was arrested. When you learnt about these um, proceedings, it was 
That was quite recently, wasn't it? These proceedings were... These proceedings? Yes. Um, you received an email from Melissa Lock, Lock, Lockwood, correct? Yes. And the contents of that email have just been tendered by uh, council assisting. And uh, they're still subject to redactions, I believe, so I won't ask that they be shown. But in, in that email, Lockwood said to you, and to whom it may concern in addition, that she had discussed with Baldwin it can be shown now, Exhibit 18.0030. This is, I expect, a summary of some sort, is it, as to Years, to what um, she had spoken to Ian Lehman about. Mm. Yes. <clears throat> Locking himself in it and the child in his office and refusing to answer on several occasions. Yes. Inappropriately touching the child in public. Yes. Constantly texting the child during the week. Apparently, yes and keeping the child separate and segregated from the other children. And um, dawning special attention to him. Yes. And she said to you in this email that Lehman brushed those concerns off and disregarded her vehement concerns as to the seriousness of the matter. Yes. Did Lehman come to you with any of these concerns having discussed, been discussed with him? Never at any stage. About any of these things? No. What about anyone else from the Board of Governance of the Church? As I said earlier, not until after Baldwin was arrested and the matter was in the hands of the police. The witness be shown ten of bundle nine, please. <coughs> this is um, obviously an email from Tom Liu to Justin Erickson. Who's Justin Erickson? Are you aware? I don't recall. I recall the name, but I don't recall his position. The position in? Within the church, or whether he's involved with some outside firm, I can't quite remember. It's sent on the 29th of March 2009. Um, now, that date, the 29th of March 2009, How does that fit in with the conviction of Baldwin? Sorry, I'm not very good with dates, so I'm not quite sure. Yeah, no, nor am I. That's what I'm asking you. Sorry. It was April 2009, wasn't it? Yes. I'm just trying to remember that. It, it appears... Uh, March 2009, Your Honour. March 2009. The sentencing remarks of His Honour Judge Robertson are... Uh, yeah, date of 27th of March, 2009. I'm grateful for my friend for that. So th this appears to have been sent two days after Baldwin was convicted. 
very shortly after, yes. <coughs> have you read it? I have read it, yes. What's, what, um, what it seems to summarise is restructuring the church. It seems that way. Restructuring the church so as to avoid... financial difficulties in the event of successful civil suits against the church. Is that right? It certainly looks that way, yes. What, 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 having seen that, uh, knowing where you, your son and your family stood, how does it make you feel in relation to how this church dealt with your son's civil case, first of all? Well, I only discovered this recently and it made me very unhappy. Um, as I've expressed clearly before on this today, um, my expectations, and I think anybody's reasonable expectations of a church's behaviour in, in a case like this would be to, particularly once the, the case of guilt is confirmed, come alongside the victim with the appropriate pastoral and associated care and now I find all this time later that rather than doing that as soon as the situation was clear they started reshuffling the deck chairs they were far more interested in preserving whatever they were trying to preserve than any thought of reaching out to the, the broken victim and had you known that was what they were doing or thinking about doing, when you sent your email that was referred to earlier uh, by council assisting, would that fit the picture that you were complaining about in relation to AOG? I objection. Uh, I, I would draw the question. Yes. Paul, you put a question. It, uh, there needs to be some distinction, certainly, between the church, that is to say the Sunshine Coast Church and the Assemblies of God. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that, obviously, in, in, we know that the evidence in this particular case was that the insurer... Um, that there was, sorry, I'll draw that. The claim was made on the church. The church claimed on its insurance. The insurer then led the mediation, as I understand it, and that ultimately... Um, the, the payment made as a result of the settlement was made by uh, the church's insurer at that stage. Uh, this issue, and that, I, I can see what the issue is that uh, Mr O'Brien is raising. It's there on the document. I really don't think this witness can take it much further. I should probably just comment that on the document it's not so much a restructure uh, but seems to be just querying whether <coughs> they buy a new property should they put it in another entity rather than restructuring existing uh, facilities. I only say that to assist the Commission, of course, I don't act for Sunshine Coast Church. Mr O'Brien. I'll move on. Ultimately, um, the civil law proceedings, as we know, were finalised in a mediated agreement. And um, as part of that agreement, your son had incurred significant legal fees. Yes. And I think the compromise agreement was in the order of $550,000 inclusive of his legal costs to that point. Is that right? Sorry, inclusive meaning? Including his legal costs. Yes, I think it was something like that. And what, are you, are you aware that his legal costs were in the order of $145,518? Yes. yes. 
and he had to pay that out of the settlement sum. That's correct. After all these years, um, and of course, for reasons you've explained, ALA is not with us today. Um, can you tell the Commission how he is dealing with the way in which this matter was finalised by the church and their insurers? He remains very disappointed and unhappy about the whole process. Um, the feeling, as I said earlier, that he was up against um, a situation and, and people who were much bigger and more powerful than he and, and left him feeling very much like he'd been pushed into a corner and not fully comprehending what was going on. So you know, he's, he's still come away from that whole process feeling like rather than being reached out to and supported, he's been belted into the corner for the Endure. Thank you. I've got no further questions. Mr O'Brien. Thank you. Mr Chowdhury. Yes. Uh, sir, my name is Craig Chowdhury. I act for Australian Christian Churches. Mm -hmm. Could I take you, please, this is in tender bundle uh, <coughs> 13. <coughs> This is the lengthy email you sent to a large list of people. Yep. And you were taken to that email uh, by your barrister a short time ago, or your lawyer, I should say. Yes. Correct? Thank you. And uh, you see that you received an email from Juanita Foote. And it's there. Do you recall receiving that? I didn't recall receiving that until I was prompted to look again earlier this week. All right. Uh, and in the second paragraph there, there's a request that if this is a legitimate email and you wish to discuss the contents of this email further, please don't hesitate to contact us. That's correct. And if you see below, we scroll down a bit further, you saw that Miss Foote was the Australian Christian, Church, Australian Christian Church's Queensland State Clerk. That is there, yes. All right. And an email address and also a phone number. That's correct. All right. Did you call her at all? As I explained earlier, in short answer, is no. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, were you aware in April of 2012 uh, that your wife, uh, ALC, had been in email contact with uh, the Queensland Executive, Australian Christian Churches? I do recall that. All right. Uh, I'm referring, uh, Your Honour, to uh, Tender Bundle 18. And the emails start from latest to earliest, you probably yes. understand. That's how they yes. act when they're printed out. Thank you. If we just go over to page three of that. Have you seen this email before, this email exchange? No, I don't believe so. Uh, did your wife <coughs> discuss with you that she was in contact uh, with Christelle Holland um, from... Queensland State Executive. I don't remember the name Christelle Holland, no. Right. Uh, anyway, if we just scroll down a bit further, we'll see the email from Christelle Holland to your wife. Just let me know once you've read that, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've read that. All right. And then if we scroll up, there's the response uh, from your wife, and it starts on page two. 
as dated the 6th of April 2012. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and uh, your wife refers to actually having a phone call, having a phone conversation with Christelle Holland uh, on the previous day. Just, we'll just get you to read this, so if we just read yep. it and then scroll down. You've read that? Yes. Did your wife tell you that she'd had a phone conversation with Christelle Holland from Australian Christian Churches? She may have. I, I don't have too memory of that. All right. Uh, in any event, you weren't aware of this email at the time that it was sent? <coughs> or you may have been, you're not sure. I may have been. I don't have too memory of it, no. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Pastor Chris... Peterson uh, and his wife provided considerable support to you and your family during that difficult time. Is that a fair comment? Yes. Did uh, Pastor uh, Peterson uh, offer counselling to your son, ALA? He did. All right. And because he... Was that offer accepted or not accepted? It wasn't accepted at that stage. I believe he was still working with the councillor that was appointed by the police. Yes. Uh, it's clear from the evidence you've given that the Queensland Police Service provided excellent yes. support to ALA and also the family. Yes. Uh, I should ask this. Did the Director of Public Prosecution's Office at Maroochydore, uh, did they provide support through a victim liaison officer? Yes. All right. And did that victim liaison officer also provide information about support services? Can you recall? I believe he would have. Detail I'm not clear on. All right. Thank you. SAT 0358 01 007, if that helps. Yes, it's tab 12 of the uh, statement bundle. Thank you. It's just coming up. This is a text that uh, Mr Swenson received on his mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can scroll out and read it, but it says, Good morning. Just want to say thank you for your time yesterday. We have just had breakfast with ALA and said thanks for yesterday to us. We know he appreciated being able to ask questions and mentioned it was good that plans have been put in place so as not allow this to happen to anyone else. Enjoy your day. Regards, ALD and ALC. Uh, you've seen that now? I've seen that now, and yes, I would, I would have sent that. You would have sent that? Yes. All right. And the sentiments you expressed in that? Yes. Were genuine? Yes. Thank you. Right. Were you aware that...
So uh, just to save some time, you said that you actually have seen this, is that correct? I have seen it, yes. Have you read it fully? Not fully, no. Uh, who gave you a copy of it to read? It um, came up as part of the evidence presented to this um, hearing. All right. Mm. Thank you. If we just scroll down that page, and there's a report on action taken. And he some, Mr Swenson summarises the details and some summary about you and your family. And if you look at the paragraph that uh, commences, I outlined that I was there pastorally on behalf of ACC. Do you see that? Yes. Just read that paragraph and tell me once you've read it. Mm That's an accurate summary mm. of the discussions you had with Mr Swenson, Yes. Correct? All right. And if you look at the last paragraph, uh, that's correct. You had many questions concerning ACC's approach and actions in your particular case, and your son's particular case, I should say, and in regards to policy generally, correct? Yes. If we go to the next page, please. If you just read the uh, first two paragraphs, let me know once you've done that. Yes. Uh, <coughs> is that an accurate statement from Mr Swenson? I'm intrigued by the word significant reinsurance as a result. I'm not sure how significant, but otherwise it's uh, definitely an accurate summary, yes. It was definitely, sorry, I just didn't hear the last one. It was definitely an accurate summary, yes. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr Swenson acknowledged that the Australian Christian churches had failed to provide an adequate response to yes. the new family. All right, thank you. <coughs> Uh, if we go to the next page, please. Uh, just scroll down. Mr Swenson sets out there uh, a number of factors that led to the failure of the Australian Christian Church as the state executive uh, and the wider movement to provide support to you. <coughs> and I want to refer you to the paragraph which has the bold type. Can you see that there? Yes. Just read that paragraph uh, that starts with procedures need to be put in place. Let me know once you read it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Do you consider that there is anything further that the Australian Christian Churches should do for families in your situation? First sentence is, is alluding to where what direction the whole process should go, and that, that is uh, in future 
due and proper support and care is provided for the victim and their families. What that due and proper support consists of is beyond my answering at the moment. Well, in this case, we know that you had uh, what you considered to be excellent support from your local pastor, uh, Pastor Peterson and his wife, correct? Yes. What support and care did you want from the Australian Christian Church and all the assemblies have got it? I would have to leave that answer to the leadership of the organisation, I think. Um, without notice, I, I can't answer that question, other than to say that until we met with Gary Swenson, nothing happened. At the least, would you have wanted an acknowledgement from the State of Executive that uh, an acknowledgement to your son that they're aware of the charges, the painful process that is occurring, and to be asked, is there something beyond what the local church is doing that we can tell? Yes. Thank you. And to be kept advised of any steps the state executive or the national body might take in respect of disciplining any of the pastors or mm. church staff involved who may have been derelict in their duties? At the very least, yes. All right. And you. as you said, those comments directed to my son as much as the family. Of course. And, uh, um, I understand that yes. ultimately it's your son is the most important person yes. uh, in this process. Mm. But uh, I was a Crown Prosecutor for many years. Uh, the family of persons or victims equally if not equally, uh, I should say, but have feelings of uh, shame and uh, feel the heartache and share a lot of the pain yes. that their child is experiencing. That's correct. I've put that inelegantly, but you understand what I'm saying? I understand, saying. yes. Thank you. Uh, all right. I should also say, uh, just as a factual matter, following... Uh, Baldwin's conviction, he lodged an appeal to yes. the Court of Appeal of Queensland. Yes. And that obviously took some time to be heard. That is correct. And then some time before the judgment was delivered. And then there was another appeal lodged as well. Or was that to the High Court? Yes. Right. All of that, no doubt, added stress to your son and your family? Yes. All right. Just pardon me for a moment. Yes, I'd love further. Thanks, Mr Chowdhury. I don't Mr. have any Taylor. questions, thank you, Your Honour, Mr Commissioner. Very briefly, Your Honour. Mr Coonigan. Sir, my name is Aaron Coonigan, and I act for Ian Lehman. Mm -hmm. I'm his lawyer. I just have some questions in relation to your understanding of who was the senior pastor in the year 2006 at the Sunshine Church. Do you recall who was that person? I did note, sorry, just as part of that answer, I did note an error in an earlier document that said something to the effect that Pastor Lehman became the pastor in 2002, I believe it was more like 2000, right. so we, we actually came to the church and he was the pastor. And um, do you recall was, him leaving at some point? Yes. There was a period where Pastor Peterson came to the church and there was a, an overlap period of weeks or months before Mr Lehman left. Um, you may know the dates, I'm not privy to the dates. Or Do you recall, dates? if you can accept from me, that Pastor Lehman left in 2006, mm -hmm. do you recall if the time that you refer to as Pastor Peterson coming to the church was during 2005? Quite possibly, but as I say, the dates escape me a bit. Do you recall a period of time when Pastor Lehman was absent from the church due to health issues? Yes. When there were changes of that nature going on in terms of who was the pastor, how were you informed of that? Informed of what, sorry? How did you become aware of who was your senior pastor? 
announcements were made publicly in, in, the, um, in the church as to what was happening at a leadership level. So, for example, when Pastor Lehman had to leave for health reasons for a period of time, there was an announcement made about that? Well, there would have been, yes. That was for surgery, I believe. And he would have been told who was replacing him? That I'm not clear on. OK. When he came to leave, finally, in 2006, do you remember the reason given? I don't clearly remember the reason given, no, sorry. Do you remember the congregation being told? I have recollection of a service where the congregation were told yes that he was moving on. Other families had, yes, and that's what we've talked about earlier today. You told Swenson that, did you, during this meeting in Broome? I imagine so. You told him that you were aware that other families had reported concerns to jo uh, regarding Jonathan Baldwin to Pastor Lehman? Yes. Did you nominate who those families were? They weren't families particularly, but they were um, the people we've spoken of earlier. The only ones I'm aware of um, were Melissa Lockwood, Tom Liu and a Celeste Village. I see. So when, when, when you say families, you mean other persons? Other persons, yeah. But it's not the case that you, or to your knowledge, your wife, ever raised those concerns with Mr Lehman? We had no concerns and were unaware that anything like this was happening until it was presented to us in the end. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Mr Cooney. Yes, nothing arising. Mr Beck. Thank you, Mr Aylbear. Thank you for your attendance and your otherwise excused. Thank you very much. I call Ian Lehman. Do you wish to take the oath or the affirmation? I'll take the oath. All right. If you would raise the Bible in your right hand, please, and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. In this royal commission. In this royal commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Just replace the Bible, please, and take a seat right where you are. Um, I understand that it's Dr. Lehman, is that correct? Yes, Doctor is the academic uh, degree I was awarded in 2000. Thank you. Um, uh, so what is your, your full name, please? Uh, Ian John Lehman. And uh, you provided your address to the Royal Commission, is that right? Yes. And um, what's your current occupation? Um, I am a pastor, um, credentialed through Crosslink Christian Network, um, based in Canberra. Um, I also work for a club um, in Caloundra, uh, and with them I'm both a courtesy bus driver, 
um, I manage the front desk at different points and perform chaplaincy duties. And uh, you provided a statement dated the 9th of October 2014 to the Royal Commission? Yes. Are there any changes you wish to make to that statement? No. Uh, is it true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes. I tender the statement. 18.0031. Uh, can I ask you first, Dr. Lamer, when did you when did you be, first become qualified as um, as a pastor within the Assemblies of God movement? It probably was would have been in nineteen ninety nine, and I would have had a credentialing interview um, to receive the credential of an OMC. And it would have been at some point, probably in the first half of 1999. And OMC stands for Ordained Ministers Credential. Credential. That's right. Um, just be, just before we proceed, um, you, you know that we're referring to the church that you were at on the Sunshine Coast as the Sunshine Coast Church. Okay. Do you understand that first? Okay, I'll, I understand it now. Yes. Um, and also we're referring to... Um, uh, the boy who was abused by Mr Baldwin as ALA. Do you understand that? I've got the sheet in front of me. I see that now. Yes. Yes. And um, there are also uh, pseudonyms for his mother and his father. Yes. You see that? Yes. All right. And there was also a non-publication direction made earlier today concerning um, ALA's current occupation. Right. Yes. So if, if you can, if you can assist us by uh, just avoiding the, those matters or um, using the pseudonyms that have been... I'll just the check the list at different points. Thank you very much. All right. Now, I understand that um, in January of 2000, you became the senior pastor at um, the Sunshine Coast Church. Is that right? Yes. And you, were, you served there until um, 2006? Yes, I formally left the church. It would have been in June 2006. In June 2006. Yes. And you, and you then became the senior pastor at, at, a, at another church, is that right? I established an independent church in the town, yes. When you say independent, so not within the... Not the, within the Assemblies of God, no. All right. Um, when you... Uh, accepted the position as senior pastor at the Sunshine Coast Church. You also became the chair of the board, is that right? Yes, there was a governmental structure in place um, when I came, and so the former senior pastor was the chairman of the board, and at that point I we flowed with that, um, that structure. All right, and there, so there was a secretary, a treasurer, and some other board members, is yes. that right? Um, in the period 2000 to 2006, what was the size of the congregation on, on average? It would have been somewhere between 170 to 200. Of course, there would have been youth in the youth ministry that aren't, weren't always at worship and other adherents, but we would have been floating around 200, yes. All right, so on uh, for a service on a Sunday, how many people would tend to turn up? Well, we had both a morning and an evening service. Uh, they would have, there would have been an overlapping, people overlapping both services and there would have been people who only came to the morning and those who only came to the evening. And so I'm indicating of a morning would have been 150, 160. Of a night time, it could have been 100 or more. All right. Now, um, while, you was, uh, while you were there as a senior pastor, Cleta, you had a, a youth pastor who assisted you with the youth ministry of the church. Is that right? Yes, and um, were there any other associate or um, other pastors, assistant pastors at the church? Um, now we're talking about during my incumbency. Yes. Um, when I initially came, when I took over the church, there was an assistant pastor who left after about three to four months. There was a youth pastor at the church when I took over in January or February of 2000 and he was in the process of being relieved of his responsibilities 
Yes, I'll come to that in a moment. I just okay. want to ask you about the staffing and the, um, and, and the passes. That okay, so during our time there was an assistant pastoral person. Yes. Um, a youth position. Yes. Um, then we had a partially paid worship position, um, so worship pastor. Um, and then there was a business manager, but that position, that was voluntary um, during that time. Um, th then we would have had people that had responsibility for children's church, um, but that person was not paid, but they would be known as part of the pastoral team. Were there any other paid employees of the church in the period 2000 to 2006? No. Um, do I, I think your daughter had a, had a position with the well, church she, at one stage. She did um, join the team um, at the close of 2004, uh, beginning of 2005, and she took over as a type of PA administrator. Right. Yes. So there was you, uh, an assistant pastoral person, but only for a short period? The pastoral assistant was with me from mid-2000 to the end of 2004. All right. So from 2004 onwards, it was sent, it was you, the youth pastor, who um, became who the, the position occupied by Mr Baldwin. That's Is that right? That's right. And then there was a, a partially paid worship position. Yes. And was that person there five days a week? No, because that their, their responsibility was more off-site and coordinating things for the Sunday worship and working with the musicians and the singers and all of that, yeah. Is it reasonable, is it reasonable to say that, it was, that the church was, a, in the scheme of things, a relatively small operation? Oh, in the context of the Assemblies of God, yes. Um, certainly we've heard from Hillsong, which That's is at the I mean. other end of the, the spectrum. spectrum. Is that That's right? right. Um, and in your experience, are there um, a large number of Assemblies of God churches that are of that that size? Yes. yes. Your Honour, I noticed the time. Yes. Uh, Dr Lehman, we're taking the lunch adjournment now until right. 2.
I should have asked you before the break, but um, you said you uh, you have a doctorate. I presume that's a PhD. No, doctor of ministry degree. Doctor of ministry. Um, is that uh, different from a doctor of theology? Yes. Yes. And which uh, which uh, university or institution did you receive that from? Uh, from Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, in California. All right. And was that a was that a, a uh, how many years did you study there for? They gave me between um, up to about nine to ten years to do all the units and then write the dissertation at the end. All right. How long was the dissertation? About two hundred pages. Thank you. Uh, when you uh, when you commenced at uh, the Sunshine Coast Church, um, you say that there was a youth pastor at the church who was facing allegations of sexual impropriety. Yes. So, um, at that stage, were, was the matter being handled by the police? No. Um, had it, um, do you know why that was the case? Sorry, I'll withdraw that. First of all, what was the nat nature of the uh, sexual impropriety as far as you were concerned? I received a phone call because I was living in Adelaide, commuting to Brisbane or to the Sunshine Coast each weekend for about two days over the weekend or three days over the weekend. And then I would be back in Adelaide once again where our residential home was. And after I had um, assumed the position about two weeks mm -hmm. in, I received a phone call from the then assistant pastor and he alerted me to the that he had a former media um, journalistic background, that there had been accusations. He had gone and interviewed the um, victims or the people who were making the allegations, and he had all this written material. That was the first I heard of it. He asked me what he should do then. And what did you say? I said I'd sit on everything until I arrive on Friday evening, because that was my, where my next um, trip was planned, on the Friday evening to be there for the weekend. And I said, if you could have two elders or two leaders present and also, and also have the youth pastor available. You referred to sexual impropriety. It was, it was that form of some form of sexual act by the youth pastor against a child? No, these were people above the age of 18... I think there were two or three um, individuals above the age of 18 in the youth ministry. And um, um, and that was... Uh, they were part of his ministry, that is to say, the youth minister's um, control? Yes, at the um, Sunshine Coast Church. Yes. So um, what, did you then, what did you then do with that information? I read it privately... With the assistant pastor present, he presented it to me, and because I did not know anybody at all, you know, in the church at that point in time, because I'd only been present on one or two Sundays, um, he, I then asked, "Do you have the youth pastor available?" He said, "Yes." I said, "Could you bring him in, please?" He brought him into the room where we were. I presented the information to him that the assistant pastor had gathered. I asked him to read it. And then I asked him to indicate to me what level of veracity was in the information. All right. So before, before we get to that, just in terms of the nature of the allegations, um, was this, as far as you could see, consensual or non-consensual sex? It did not go as far as sexual intercourse was my understanding. There was some form of sexual contact? That is my understanding, yes. And was it consensual as far as you knew? My understanding would have been that as the person in responsibility, he had drawn him into some form of engagement in a private 
Right. So the impropriety, as far as you were concerned, was the misuse of his position as a pastor in the church to engage in some form of sexual conduct with um, the young people who are part of the congregation? Yes. All right. So what happened? You, you confronted him with this material and what occurred? He basically said to me that it was 90% accurate. All right. And what did you then do? I called in the two, or there would have been two either directors or elders of the church. I explained to them what had just taken place and we asked him to cease all responsibilities at that point. And did he? Yes. Um, and what steps, if anything, did you take to... Um assist, support, counsel those uh, those young people who engaged in those acts with him? Right. My, my next step was because I was, tra I was travelling between Adelaide and Brisbane. I, when I returned to Adelaide, I spoke to um, Pastor Danny Guglamucci, who was the pastor at Southside Church where I had been for the last 18 months. He was also the state superintendent in South Australia. He said to me, because um, this happened in Queensland, it was not under his jurisdiction. So he advised me to contact the leadership, state leadership in Queensland. Yes. So I rang the state leadership in Queensland. They said to me that... Who's, who did you speak to then? Wayne Alcorn. I knew Wayne because as a Lutheran pastor, I was just outside of Ipswich, where he was, where he pastored. Um, he said that since the said individual did not have any ministry credential, um, either a PMC or an OMC, it was an internal matter for the congregation. Were you aware when you took over as senior pastor of the Sunshine Coast Church that the youth pastor was not a credentialed minister? No, I, would, I did not ask that question. I'd, in fact, on the, on the Sunday when I was there to um, do my initial, um, I guess, preach to the church, he was rather absent, and I don't think I even met him on that particular day. All right, well, let's, uh, let's go back to the issue of those who... Um, those, if I can use the term... Sorry, I'll withdraw that. The, those young people who were engaged in the sexual acts with the, um, the then youth pastor, you know, the, the people I'm referring to, after you'd taken the matter to the South Australian State Executive and then spoken to... Um, Wayne Alcorn about that issue. Um, first of all, did he suggest that the um, Assemblies of God would, as would assist with some form of support for those um, people who had been the subject of the sexual attention of the youth pastor? No, that wasn't offered. Right. Did he suggest that... Uh, was there anything that you should do as a senior pastor of the church? Well, the matter was left in my hands as the new incumbent senior pastor. Oh, I understand that, but did he suggest to you that you should have done anything to assist those members who had been uh, engaged in some form of sexual act with the youth pastor? No, my understanding was that that was something that we needed to address. So what did you do? My assistant pastor was in charge of pastoral care, um, that is the the pastor who had taken undertaken the interviews. And so I would have asked him to do pastoral care towards those <coughs> persons. You don't recall doing so. You think you, you think you would have. Is that right? No, I would have asked him. I asked him. Do to... you recall asking him? Yes. He was in charge of pastoral care. These people were not personally known to me at all. I had no level of relationship with them at all. Or save that they were part of the, your, the, your congregation at which you were the senior min, minister, is that right? Yes, but I would, I'd only, this is my second or third week and I'd only been there for two weekends. Um, and so I, 
I didn't know them personally. Did you have any further engagement with them to provide them with some form of partial yes, or other support? I, I did meet with the parents and those young adults that chose to meet with me to talk to them about it, yes. All right. Did you offer counselling to those people? Yes. Did they accept it? In two instances they did. In one instance, I believe it was rejected or declined. All right. At the end of your statement... Uh, in Is that right? Well, 2000, maybe late 2001, his wife had been worshipping in the church on a continuing basis all that time. And um, did you establish whether the sexual offences had occurred at the church? They had not occurred at, at the church that I was pastor of. Did, um, did you establish whether any of that senior pastor's victims were at the church still? They weren't. The victims of the, the senior pastor who had yes. been convicted of child sexual offences? The offences occurred in a totally different region in Queensland to the region where I was pastoring. All right. Do I take it then that you assumed that his victims were not part of your congregation at the Sunshine Coast Church? I went and personally visited him and none of the victims were part of the church. Did you ask him that? Yes. And when you say with clear guidelines in place, what's, what are you referring to there? His family had borne a terrible burden, so he had children that were at the church as well. As long, along with his wife, and the man was in hiding. And so I said it, the clear guidelines were in terms of he could come to worship, he was to sit at the back of the church where he was clearly obvious, he was to go nowhere near the children's church. Um, after worship in what we would term the public fellowship event when people had cups or tea or coffee, he was to get his tea or coffee and then move right to the um, fringe of the area and stand in the open and not um, touch, have anything to do with any children or encourage them to come near him at all. All of his conversations had to be with mature adults. Did you have any policy or procedure that guided you in that process? No, I wouldn't have had a printed policy as such, no. So this was on, these were conditions you opposed on him um, uh, that you imposed on him just um, by su suggesting them to him orally? Sitting down and speaking to him, then also speaking with the elders or directors and outlining the process that was that would be put in place and speaking with the pastoral team as well. Um, were you aware of a, a process within the Assemblies of God called the Individual Support and Accountability Plan for those who had committed sexual offences? No. No. Were you aware of any policy at the, um, the state ACC or Assemblies of God at that stage level, which assisted you in going through the process of setting up a, um, a, pro, 
appropriate protocols for sex offenders engaging with the church? No. Did you um, speak with them? Did you make any contact with them to see whether there was such a policy? No, I didn't. Now, it brings us to the issue of policies within uh, the Sunshine Coast Church. Um, Dr Lehman, we've made some attempts to obtain all the policies that we can from that church that applied um, during the period 2004 through to, um, well, through to today. Um, and we have not been able to locate any policies for the period 2004 to 2006. Um, are you aware of any policies about the protection of children that applied during those three years? I have no awareness of any formally written policies, no. Um, when you became aware that there was somebody who had been convicted of child sexual offences who would be coming to the church, did you consider that the church should have formal child protection policies in place in the eventuality that there was some form of abuse? I would have spoken to the team and all the relevant people and we would have had a clear understanding of our process. But the process was never written down? No. Did you, at that stage, in, um, you said that I think it was about 18 months into your tenure there, any time between then and when you left the Sunshine Coast Church, did you contact the um, Assemblies of God to ask them for some assistance in establishing such a policy? No. <clears throat> Did anybody from the Assemblies of God contact you to suggest that you adopt um, some form of child protection policies in that period up till 2006? No. I'll show you a document. Um, if exhibit um, 18... 0028 could come up on the screen. You see this is a document entitled Child Abuse. Have you seen this document before? I saw it this morning. Yes. Um, and is this a document that, um, that you created? No. Is this a document that um, you've seen before, to, before today? No. Are you able to assist us at all with who drew up this document, which is dated about the time that I think you left the church? No. So I take it then that during the period you were the senior pastor at, um, at uh, the Sunshine Coast Church, that there was no written policy at all for child protection matters. Is that right? That I'd say yes. You said um, earlier that, the, that, that there was a process at the, um, at the Sunshine Coast Church, obviously not a written process, but what was the process to your understanding during that period of time? In terms of in terms of child abuse, yes. If people had concerns, they would have either gone to the pastoral assistant; she was a female at that stage, or they would have come to me personally or they would have gone to one of the other leaders in the church. Yes. Uh, I think um, the court officer is just going to um, adjust your microphone.
and and what would you, as a leader of the church, if you received such information, what would you, during that period up to 2006, have done with that information? I would have acted upon it. <clears throat> what would you have done in acting upon it? If um, it was an event, well, I mean, uh, um, if the issue was with <clears throat> the church, I, with a witness or another team member or another spiritual leader, would have sat down with the person and confronted them. All right. Um, and would you... Uh, do I take it that you would have interviewed the, uh, the victim, if I can use that term? Would you Are interview you the victim first before you went ahead with that? Yes. Um, and if the victim was a child, what... What, what, what was the process that you envisaged would happen in that circumstance? We, well, then I would have had the parents present. I wouldn't have talked to the child by, by ourselves. All right. What other steps would you have taken, having uh, received that information, apart from speaking to the parents? We would have um, mandatory reported it. To whom? The police. And what about the Department of Child Protection under whatever name it was at that stage? Would you have reported it to them as well? We would have done it as well, yes. All right. Um, and is there any reason why you didn't commit those steps to writing in some form of policy to operate at the church? We had created statements for the team in terms of heterosexual relationships. We had all of those in place. I know that. Uh, Male-female relationships at all different levels. We hadn't done it. Um, I take it from the evidence that's been given to date that there were a large number of children that uh, accompanied their parents to, this, to the church on a regular basis. Oh, yes, there would have been, yes. And there was a large children's ministry headed by a youth pastor during the time that you were there. There, there was a child. There were people in charge of the children's work, separate to the youth ministry. Yes. Um, but there was both a children's ministry and a youth ministry. Is that right? Yes. And youth ministry includes children under the age of eighteen. Yes. And. At no time up until two thousand and six did you consider that it was worthwhile adopting some process, some formal process and policies to deal with allegations of child sexual abuse? We didn't formalise it. Is there any particular reason why that was the case? It's probably the task of writing it. Do you consider that it was a failing of um, the church and you as senior pastor while you were there that such a policy was not drawn up and adopted by you? It was certainly something that should have been put in place. And you were the person as senior pastor to put it in place? Or I should have directed one of the team who maybe had more skills to write it. Yes, but you had responsibility for doing that, didn't you? Yes. And did you make any approaches to uh, the Assemblies of God at the state or indeed at the national level to determine what um, policies and procedures may have been available to you that you could adopt at a local level? No. Were you aware that um, from about 2005, a number of states, um, certainly including New South Wales and Victoria, had adopted child, really quite detailed policies concerning child protection? No. Was it ever, were you ever told by somebody from the state executive in Queensland that there were such policies and that they would be available for you at a local level to adopt? No. Um, 
prior to 2004, had you had much personal experience with allegations of child sexual abuse? No. Um, had you ever handled any complaints in previous roles as a pastor relating to the sexual abuse of children? No. Right. Now, just about the, um, the recruitment process for Mr Baldwin, um, I understand that um, you met him in, first in Adelaide and he was suggested to you as a, as a possible replacement youth pastor for the one that had been recently terminated, is that right? Between the time that um, the first youth pastor was terminated that you've referred to, um, to the time that um, Johnny was um, suggested to me, there would have been about a two to a two and a half year gap. <clears throat> Uh, and when you recruited him, uh, you did so on the basis of him being recommended to you because of a use, his position as a youth pastor in Adelaide? Um, yes, myself and members of the, the team were attending a conference in Adelaide at the Southside Christian Church. On the day before the conference began, um, I was with the team in the Barossa Valley, which was my um, home of origin, and I received a phone call that day from the um, senior associate at Southside saying that they had a name to put forward to me um, to fill the youth pastor vacancy. Okay, and uh, the, the position that was to be filled by him as youth pastor, he had both um, obligations with respect to ministering to youth as well as children, or was it just youth? It was primarily youth. All right. And what sort of ages fall within that category? When he began um, his tenure, there would have been what we would have termed a, a senior youth group, a senior youth ministry. And so that would have been from about 13 or 14 onwards. All right. So ALA was in that older group, as you, yes. you call them? Um, when you were recruiting him, did you establish what training he had had to become a youth pastor at your church? Uh, yes. Um, he reminded me that I had taught him in Bible college at Southside in the year and a half that I was there. Is that a, is that a course that includes child protection issues? I could not answer in terms of the whole syllabus. Um, the subjects that I taught were <coughs> biblical. Did you establish in recruiting uh, Mr Baldwin whether he had been engaged in any form of child protection issues? <coughs> were there any issues with him at Southside? Is no. That... Did you establish when you were rec rec recruiting Mr Baldwin whether he had... Oh, sorry, I've not... I can see... I withdraw the question. I'll ask it. And I'll ask it again. Um, did you establish when you were recruiting Mr. Baldwin whether he had been trained in any form of child protection matters? No. Um, you knew he was coming to work directly with children in your church, didn't you? Young adults, yes. And that um, this is. 2003-2004, you were aware that certainly those matters were ones that, um, sorry, that matters of child protection were important in ministering to children within your church, didn't you? Yes. Why did you not seek information from him about his knowledge of child protection issues before appointing him. It would not have been a part of the process that we would have asked about. Um, I think it's, there was a screening process, wasn't there, <coughs> of some, some description in the sense that uh, Mr Baldwin 
was required to have something called a blue card. Yes. You know what that term means? Yes. And that relates to a, a clearance process, including um, a police checking yes. of, of the person? Oh, he would have had the blue card, yes. Yes. Did you ask him about whether he had a blue card at the recruitment process? He needed one to work with youth. Right. Because he had been part of the youth ministry at Southside. And did he... Well, that's with respect to South Australia. The blue card is something that's issued in Queensland. Do you, do you understand that? Well, he would have got one then when he was here, because I had one myself, yes. All right. Did you ensure that he had one when he started as a, as a youth minister? I honestly can't say that I asked him to show it to me, no. All right. Now... He came and lived you, with you, I think, um, you say, for the, about the first six months of his That's time in, uh, at the Sunshine Coast. Is that right? Yes. And um, during that time, he came to meet and with, with ALA. ALA was part of his congregation. Well, part of the congregation, yes, part of his youth ministry, yes. Yes. And um, now you... Do I take it that by this stage, by 2004, um, he was... Sorry, first of all, you were at the church 9 to 5, Monday to Friday? I believe my, my day off was on Friday, so I would have been there um, Monday to Thursday, and then I, my day off was on Friday, and maybe I would have been there on a Saturday, depending on how the, how the week was structured. And uh, did you observe, um, sorry, was it your role to supervise or to oversee the work of uh, Mr Baldwin as a youth minister? He was accountable to me, yes. And um, he ran programs at the church, which um, included, I think, a, a, a musical program, is that right? He would have had his own youth band that he established. Yes. And were you aware? furniture he would give it a youth um, feel if I use that term and sometimes they would have what we could term thematic nights uh, and um, so they would buy resources to deck the church out to uh, shift all the furniture and make it um, an environment that would be um, positive for whatever theme or direction they were taking the night in all right and um, I think from time to time there are also um occasions where um, those in the youth ministry slept over at the church, is that right? No, not... You're talking on a regular basis? Well, on a regular or irregular basis. From time to time, did, uh, did no. members of the youth congregation come and sleep over at the church? No. What about at um, the other premises that was used for the youth ministry? No, it was at the close of 2004. Uh, the youth group had grown to about 80. Um, the wear and tear on the church building being dismantled and then reset up for Sunday worship was becoming quite extensive. And so um, I gave permission, along with the board, uh, for Johnny to hire a building that was just across the road on Queen Street 
um, in Caloundra. ALA in the car with uh, Mr Baldwin on a number of occasions, is that right? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, was there any particular policy governing um, the riding of riding in a car operated by Mr Baldwin or by you, for example, and having children from the congregation in that vehicle? No. Um, did you have any concerns at all that um, a child in a car alone with um, a pastor at your church may be cause for concern in terms of the possibility of child sexual abuse? No. That didn't occur to you at all? No. Um, were there any safeguards that you're aware of in the sense of guides to Mr Baldwin or indeed anybody else at the church about being alone with children at the church? In terms of his youth ministry, one safeguard would have been the office door was always open. Secondly, he would have advised... Um, Sorry, you say your office door or no, the his, office of the... His, his office door. Was that something that you told him specifically not to do, not to do? Well, he knew I kept my own open all the time unless I actually had um, somebody in there that was wanting to transact a, a private or confidential conversation. I was, I was having a meeting. But you didn't, uh, you didn't specifically instruct him not to meet with children with a door closed? I would have... I would have set out what I did and would have asked him to do the same. Well, do you recall doing that specifically? Yes. With Mr Baldwin? Yes. What, what did you say to him? I would have said that unless you're, you know, and if you're counselling somebody, if, say, it was a female, you need a woman present. Um, well, so it, it's very important in, in, in giving evidence that um, you state precisely what you recall saying. Right. And, the occasion when you say it, um, and not if you can, if if you can avoid it, not um, reconstruct what you should have done okay. at that time. No. So that's why I'm asking you: Do you recall a particular occasion when you provided instructions to Mr. Baldwin about his behaviour around children? I would have specifically told him to meet with them with the door open because he had planning meetings and other events like that that he held in his office. Um, he um, gave leadership training or what he called leadership training to, to young people and young adults. So all of those events, the door would have been open. It's only if somebody was coming to him with a, um, a really personal issue. Now you said a moment ago that... Um, <clears throat> I thought I understood you say that you didn't tell him that, but you, by example, always had meetings with the door open. 
Was that uh, is that your recollection of what occurred? No, I would have given my example and I would have also asked him to do that. You recall doing that? You say, I would have. It appears to say that you thought you had acted in that way, but you can't recall. Is that the position or is it the fact that you do remember saying that to uh, Mr Baldwin? <clears throat> I would have said it to him. I did say it to him. What was the occasion on which you did say it to him? Was it the start of his um, his tenure there, at the end of it? No, it would have been at the start of his tenure. All right. Now, you refer... Statement that um, that um, you, that there was that, sorry I withdraw that you say in your statement that uh, you were concerned about the intensity of his relationship with ALA is that right yes and that was on the basis of um, a number of approaches from various people within the congregation is that right it would have been. Um what, what we would term pastoral team members um, who come to me and said, um, Johnny seems to be spending a lot of time um, with ALA. Yes, what else did they tell you about um, the, the interaction between Mr Baldwin and Mr ALA? That was it. Were you told about um, the massaging of shoulders by Mr Baldwin of ALA? No. Were you told that ALA was massaging the, shol the shoulders of um, Mr Baldwin? No. Now, um, there was um, a member of the congregation by the name of Ms Lockwood. Do you recall that name? Yes. First of all? Do you recall that? Yes. And... Recall an occasion where she came to you and told you about having found Mr Baldwin and Mr ALA in his office with the door locked? No. Do you recall being told that um, she knocked on the door and there was some pause and then the door was opened by Mr Baldwin. Do you recall that? No. Do you recall...
You didn't become aware of that until after he'd been char charged by the police? Yes. Um, do you recall also being told by her that, that is Ms Lockwood, that um, there was a mattress in the room and there was a laptop where it appeared a video had been playing? No. Doesn't ring a bell at all? No. Um, so do I take it that your evidence is that you deny being told that at all? Yes. Right. Were you told by her anything about the interaction between Mr Baldwin and ALA? I cannot identify any specific time when she came into my office, sat down in front of my desk and said, I wish to share the sp specific information. Well, whether it was done in that way or any other way, was there ever a conversation between you and Ms Lockwood where she raised issues concerning the interaction of Mr Baldwin and ALA? She, she worked voluntarily in the office context and sometimes looked after the front desk, um, did other things. I think at some point she assisted Johnny in the youth ministry. So can you please answer my question about communication about Mr Baldwin and ALA from her during that period 2004 and 2005? No, I, I do not remember any specific communication. Did she, did she at any stage refer to inappropriately touching by, of ALA by Mr Baldwin in public? If that had been reported to me, I would have taken it further. Did she ever refer to you about any form of... Uh, sorry, I'll withdraw that. Did she refer to you, um, Mr Baldwin, constantly texting the child during the week? No. Did she say to you words that indicated that Mr Baldwin was keeping ALA separate and segregated from other children during church activities? No, because I... No. You say earlier on that you had a number of uh, conversations with um, those members of the congregation or of the church which indicated to you that there was a degree of intensity in the, of the relationship between Mr Baldwin and Mr ALA, is that right? Yes. And you say in your statement that you raised the issue on three occasions with Mr Baldwin, is that right? Yes. All right. So let's go to the first occasion. Do you recall when you first raised it with Mr Baldwin? I don't have a specific time date, no. Was it earlier, early in Mr Baldwin's tenure or late in his tenure? No, it would have been in 2004. In 2004, and what made you raise the matter with Mr Baldwin? Staff would have come to me and said they're spending too much time together. Which staff? Um, it would have been the worship pastor. would have seen this happen at Southside as well, where the youth pastor had young, young adults of differing ages carrying their books, setting up for them, doing all of this. When I, and so it was not something that at that point was untoward to me. Um, and what did you say to Mr Baldwin? I, would, I encouraged him, I said, broaden your, um, your group, um, 
don't don't just use um, ALA, use other people as well. Um, people have expressed some concerns to me, and I would like you to um, modify your approach and behaviour. And um, did you then notice that he did modify his behaviour? A lot of the time I wasn't around. Um, in other words, I wasn't at youth gatherings. Um, I, I wasn't, I didn't sit on, in on uh, his um, youth leadership training, etc. cetera. Um, I wasn't there on a Friday when... Um, they so you, do I take it then that you trusted him to act in accordance with what you had suggested he do? Is yes. that right? Yes. But there was a, then a second occasion when you raised with uh, Mr Baldwin um, some inappropriateness in the intensity of his relationship with ALA. His response was that he was mentoring the young well, man. First of all, what caused you to go and speak with Mr Baldwin on a second occasion? It would have been... Well, you keep the, saying I, it would have been. What do you recall specifically it was that led you to take the matter up with Mr Baldwin for a second time? It would have been the verbalisation of the same concerns. Spending time together, That's right. intensity of the relationship. Yes. Was there some physical contact between the two of them? No. You don't recall being told by Ms Lockwood that um, they were seen pitching, pinching each other's uh, nipples? No. All right. And so you spoke with him a second time, and what did, what did you say to him? It would have been in the same vein as my first conversation. Do you recall where you had that conversation? Um, I would have had both conversations over lunch, um, away from the church premises. Was there any particular reason why you um, took that matter off church premises and had it over lunch? Well, we were we were private, and it was the two of us. And what did he say? He once again um, spoke about mentoring, encouraging ALA, and he assured me there was nothing deviant. At this stage, uh, Mr Baldwin was dating your daughter, is that right? Yes. And, in fact, they'd been dating for some, some time. Is that right? They would have dated for about three to four months and then the relationship was suddenly broken off. And did it resume at some stage after that? Yes, in about February of 2005 when I underwent my first hip replacement. All right, and uh, ultimately they were married at the end of 2005, is that right? On New Year's Eve, yes. And there was a third occasion where you raised the matter of the intensity of his relationship with Mr ALA, wasn't there? Yes. And what was that occasion? Once again, it, it wasn't... It was nothing to do with touch. It, it was, once again, the, the time they were spending together. He assured me that um, ALA had great potential. He was training him in terms of um, speaking, taking, or would use the term devotions at the, at the youth meetings. And he said he was heavily involved in the setting up of the um, auditorium or the space that they were using. And the occasion where he wanted to give Miss, uh, Mr ALA a large number of awards towards the end of 2005, is that some time later or is it um, in close proximity no, that... to the third conversation you'd had? Oh, no, that would have been much later. All right. Well, let's go back to that period.
you mean, am I aware that when they move? of improper relationship between Mr Baldwin and ALA? No. I would have I would have done something different then. Did you ever occur to you that there was some possibility that there may have been some sexual abuse of ALA by Mr Baldwin? No. Did you ever particularly at the end of the third conversation you'd had with Mr Baldwin, ever considered that you'd needed some external advice to handle this particular matter? No. You were content to handle it entirely yourself? Because I never believed or thought that anything deviant was happening. Yet you had a 25-year-old man, Mr Baldwin, spending a large amount of time and engaging in an intense relationship with a boy who was between the ages of 12 and 14. Did that not cause you to reconsider whether that intensity of the relationship was proper or not? At the same time he was dating our daughter, for part of that time he was living in our home and I, there was nothing that gave rise to any of those thoughts in my mind. Was it because you didn't want to hurt your daughter who was dating him that you thought there was nothing going on? No, because I would never have exposed her to what she has been exposed to. I would, I would never have done that to her. I would, have, I would have ended the relationship any way I could have if I had a crystal Were you concerned that your daughter's boyfriend might have been wrongly accused of having an improper relationship with a 12 to 14 year old? When I... You mean at that specific point in time in 2004, 2005? That's correct. But that accusation was never made to me. Not in those words. I didn't say that. I said, were you concerned that your daughter's boyfriend might have been wrongly accused of having an improper relationship with a 12 to 14 year old? No, because I believe their relationship was quite stable. I spoke to Amanda about it. You saw nothing wrong at all in all of those interactions I've just taken you through between Mr Baldwin and ALA? No. Now, you didn't, in that period of time, up until you left um, the church in 2006, did you ever seek advice from the Department of uh, Child Protection in Queensland about the interactions that Mr Baldwin was having with ALA? No. And you didn't seek advice from the Assemblies of God either, is that right? That's right. Um, then 
we come to the uh, towards the end of 2005, and I think at that stage, uh, Mr. Baldwin and I presume your daughter determined that they would move to the Gold Coast. Is that right? That followed their their marriage. Yes. All right. And why was it the case that Mr. Baldwin left the church in uh, in 2005? To your knowledge, I had a second hip replacement. Um, between at the end of May and would have gone June, July into August. And when I came back to the... Because I couldn't um, go to my office. It was 18 stairs up on the first floor. So in the time of my recuperation, any team meetings happened at our home um, because I was on crutches and the stairs would have been an obvious hindrance to two hip replacements if I so, lost my balance. So why did Mr Baldwin leave? I, when I finally came back to the church... I threatened to terminate his employment there and then. So there was a breakdown in the relationship yes. between you and him? Yes. Uh, was there any discussion about the way in which he'd engaged with ALA in that process? No, the, the termination was in terms of his actions of going behind my back while I was recuperating in hospital and then at home and taking his focus elsewhere. Now, after he left, um, you left shortly after that, is that right? Uh, it would have been June 2006. So about six months after he left, you then left the church, is that right? Yes. And um, you're aware that he was charged with offences from the period of 2004 through to 2006, do you understand that? Yes. And that the uh, offending behaviour began in about April or May of 2004. Did you know that? No. And um, that a number of the early indecent assaults occurred in uh, a car in which Mr Baldwin and ALA were in. Were you aware of that? No. Did you witness any of that occurring? No. While he was living with you? No. Um, and did you know that the sexual offending occur continued throughout 2004 and 2005? Did you know that? Only when my daughter informed me after the charges had been laid. And were you aware that after the marriage in 2006 that the uh, sexual offending continued? All I knew is that ALA had stated their place on the Gold Coast. I knew that, that he had gone down to see them, yes. All right. How many, how many occasions had he done that? I, I couldn't tell you whether it was one or five. I just know that I was aware that he had gone down there. And you knew he was about 15 years old at that stage? He went with his parents' permission. How do you know that? Because at the end of 2005, they sent Johnny and ALA to Adelaide to a, the same conference that I was attending. And was that a residential conference? No, it was at the Southside Church. Yes, yeah, residential in the sense that they stayed over overnight or for a few days? In oh, Adelaide. the conference would have gone for three to three days at least. And um, was Mr Baldwin there to supervise ALA? That, that was my understanding. It was not organised by myself. And... Then the further visits to the Gold Coast by ALA, um, were you aware of specific permission being given by ALA's parents for that to occur? Well, this, this happened.
his later twenties and your daughter were having a a fifteen year old come and stay with them? It wasn't something that Mandy wanted to happen. Um, I gathered that that's your is that your daughter? Yes, right. Sorry, yes. My understanding was that um, ALA wanted to spend some time with Johnny down there. All right. Um, so, are you aware as to when uh, when Mr. Baldwin left your church, the Sunshine Coast Church, and moved, including to the Gold Coast? Did he? Keep his credential? Yes. To your knowledge? Yes, in a conversation that we have only had in the last fortnight, he indicated to me, he said to me that he only surrendered it when the charges were formally laid. Um, you know that that is uh, not the case? Well, once again, I can only give you the oral tradition that I'm aware of. Yes, all right. Um, and what about you? Did you keep your credential with the ACC after you left... Um, the Sunshine Coast Church in June of 2006? I would have probably surrendered it within 12 months of that once I'd made the transition to a Crosslink. Now, later you became aware that um, your son-in-law had um, been charged with crim certain criminal offences? In 2007, yes. And... Now, we know that he was charged on the... ..24th of May 2007. And do you recall how soon after that you became aware of that matter? Um, I believe that that evening, or whenever the... Um, ..whenever he was removed from the home or from the unit where they were living... Um, our daughter rang my wife, or I'm not sure if I was home that night. I know that my wife got a very distraught phone call. Our daughter had no idea what was unfolding, and all she could say to my wife was that Johnny's been taken by two police. They, I have no information. Um, she knew he'd been taken to the Sunshine Coast um, police station, and I believe she might have... And I think she told my wife that his father is down there to try and find out what's happening. Your Honour, just, just to be clear, so that the witness isn't confused, perhaps my friend can provide him with the assistance of paragraph 34 of his statement, um, so that we're not across purposes later on in the transcript about the precise date. Sorry, I missed the uh, last part there. Paragraph 34. Yes. You've put to him May after he was charged, but the evidence is given to him when he was taken away to be interviewed. Yeah, so in 34 you say you were not aware of ALA's complaint until April of 2007. Well, have I got the date wrong? Well, the information that we have, and it's in the supplementary tender bundle at tabs 31 and 35, he was interviewed and charged with 10 offences on the 24th of May 2007. Oh, then I have the wrong date. I have the wrong month. Um, in, in any event, did you... Uh, you were aware that um, those sorts of allegations, you were aware of what the allegations were, I presume? Not the extent of them until... Um, but you I... understood it was sexual abuse of a child, yes. didn't you? And um, you were aware that um, there was a process within the Assemblies of God for considering whether to withdraw the credentials of somebody who... Um, had engaged or been accused of engaging in such behaviour? I could, I could understand that process would have been in place, but because I was no longer serving in the Assemblies of God, that wouldn't have concerned me. All right, so I'll just show you... Um, tab 52, if that could come up on the screen... C 
see that there's a ministerial code of conduct for credentialed ministers in the Assemblies of God in Australia. Yes. Is that a, a document that you've seen before? I would have been given it back in 1999 when um, I sat for my OMC interview. All right. I'm, I'll seek some advice from Mr Chowdhury as to the date of this particular document. Um, and whether the one you were given in 1999 was different at all okay. from this one. Uh, but if we presume that this was um, this was the case, if we move through to implementation of the code, which is on Ringtail 82, the last page of the document, uh, I just wonder if I could help. I'm second last page. Sorry, Mr. Becker. I'm instructed that this code that's up on the screen was not implemented until 2007. All right. Thank you. Um, you'll see implementation of the code. Do you see there that there are two paragraphs about um, caution and prohibited areas? Do you see that? Yes, I do, yes. And do you recall whether the code that you had practice under while you were at Sunshine Coast Church had that kind of... The, differentiation between cautions and prohibited areas? No, I'd have no awareness of that at all. All right. Um, you'll see it says in the second paragraph that with any breach of the code of conduct in a prohibited area, the minister in breach must notify the state president. Do you see that? Yes. And so there was an obligation placed upon a credential holder to report that matter to the State President of the Assemblies of God. Yes. Did you understand that that was the Code of Conduct in 2007? Well, I was no longer in the AOG in 2007. Yes, I understand that. But certainly you knew, first of all, that somebody with such a credential had just been charged with sexual offences against a child? In 2007. In 2007, you knew that? Right. Well, is that correct? I, well, when, as I said, when our daughter rang us, yes. I became aware that there yes. was a process unfolding yes. that could lead to the laying of charges. All right. OK. And charges were laid later that year? Yes. You don't recall the date that they were laid, no. as I understand it. No. We have that from other information, but uh, you're shaking your head. No. Yeah. All right. And but you knew that the Ministerial <coughs> Code of Conduct, first of all, prohibited sexual behaviour towards children? I would have understood that, just as, a, as relating to a Christian pastor, yes. And that that would have affected um, a credential holder if they'd engaged in that form of conduct? Yes. And you knew your son-in-law had such a credential with the Assemblies of God? He would have only secured it in 2005. Well, but nonetheless, he was a youth minister with a credential from the Assemblies of God yes. that he'd had for two years by 2007. Right, according, yes. According to you, you accept that? Yes. Did you consider that it was appropriate as a relatively recent pastor within the Assemblies of God, that the relevant authorities, the state executive of the Assemblies of God, should have been told about those charges? I'm not understanding something because in 2007, Johnny was not under my authority. He was at another church called Generations yes. on the Gold Coast. And so he had moved on, and I had moved in a different direction as so well. As, as far as you were concerned, effectively, because you'd left the Assemblies of God, that it was no longer your responsibility to take any steps to report, for example, to those who were issuing credentials or monitoring credentials, that there was a serious allegation against one of their ministers. No, I didn't. I would never have even. I wouldn't have seen that as my responsibility. Did you understand that um, 
notwithstanding the charge that Mr Baldwin could continue to minister, notwithstanding those, the laying of those charges? Yes, he was still holding the credential, yes. And notwithstanding the fact that he had been charged with sexual offences against children, there was a distinct possibility that he would continue to minister to children in the role that he held in 2007. Yes. And that therefore, that there may have been a risk to those children that Mr Baldwin could have sexually abused those children under his ministry. But if I was no longer his senior pastor, wasn't that the responsibility of the senior pastor in the church to which he went? Well, if he knew, perhaps. But what steps did you take to tell that senior pastor about the charges? Oh, you're speaking about the questions that were raised while he was on the, at the Sunshine Coast Church. I'm talking about the... I'm asking you, in 2007, I'm, perhaps I, I'll put it a, a slightly different way. You knew that your son-in-law was ministering to children at a new church. Oh, you? by 2000... Sorry, now I'm understanding the question. Yes. By 2007, when the charges were laid, he had left that church as well. And he was back on the Sunshine Coast. I see. And he... So now, now, I'm, now I'm clear. I, I, was, I was confused as to what you were asking. All right. So as part of that, as part of his um, ministering in 2007, did he have access to children? When he was at the Gold Coast? No, when he was at the Sunshine Coast. You say he'd returned to the yeah, Sunshine Coast. Yeah, but he, he was no longer active in ministry. I see. OK, well, let me establish the chronology first. Sorry, there may I'm, be some yeah, confusion. I'm a, I'm a little bit at cross purposes right. here. So he leaves at the start of 2006 and goes to and moves to the Gold Coast? To a church called Generations. And how long was he there for? Well, it would have been 2006 and part of 2007. When he was charged, was he no? He still was at that he was living back on the Sunshine Coast. All right, and was he at a new church? No, he was. He wasn't. No, he had no pastoral responsibility at all. All right, okay. He was working for his father at, in the bakery. Okay, was there a possibility that he could have returned to ministry in two thousand and seven? No, he was actively pursuing work with his father. All right. But in any event, he still held the credential of a, of a minister of the Assemblies of God. Johnny's words to me were that when the charges were laid, he voluntarily surrendered his credential. And when did he say that to you? Oh, that would have only been recently. All right. But back in 2007, when he was charged, did you suggest to him that he should surrender his credential while the charges were being determined? No. Did you consider informing the State Executive of the Assemblies of God that charges had been laid, um, which concerned allegations of child sexual abuse? No. Did you suggest to them that they may wish to consider his credential in the light of those charges? No. Those are my questions. Thanks. Thank you. I'd ask to go now. Yes. Mr O'Brien. My name's O'Brien, and I, uh, I appear for ALA. His mother and father. Um, Council Sissing asked you, and you responded in the affirmative that uh, there had been three occasions where you were approached by members of the church who complained of Baldwin's close connection with ALA. 
I said there were three times that I spoke with Baldwin about his close connection. Did each of those three occasions that you spoke to him arise out of different conversations that you'd had with people who'd raised concerns about it with you? You're asking were they different people? No, I'm asking whether on three separate occasions people came to you and said Baldwin is too close to ALA or to that effect. The um, concerns would have come more from out of the team and the directors. Well, I'll ask again because that's not responsive. I want to know if on three separate occasions people came to you from the church and asked and told you of their concerns about the connection between ALA and Mr Baldwin. Yes, there would have, there must, there would have been three occasions when somebody spoke to me. Because there were three occasions where you then spoke to Baldwin. Yes. <coughs> Who approached you on the first of those three occasions? Which people? I can't specifically remember names. I, I indicated it probably came out of the pastoral team. Well, who was on the pastoral team when that, uh, when the first uh, complaint, if you like, was raised with you? There would have, you mean the names of the people? Yes. Uh, there would have been Jeannie Jensen, who was my pastoral assistant. Um, Rebecca Borchett would have been responsible in the area of worship. Um, Johnny would have been the youth pastor. Um, and at that point, there would have been um, a Kathy Curtis who coordinated the office for us. So on the first occasion, it was any of those, excluding, yes. of course, Mr Baldwin? Yes, and it might have been a number of them. It Except could have been. What about the second occasion? Who was it who raised the concern on the second occasion that led to your second in in intervention, if you like, with Baldwin? Once again, I believe it came out of that same context. Was, was it the same people? Yes, well, the, the other name I haven't put in there was Tom Liu, the business manager. He would have also been part what, of it. What role did he have on the board? He was what we'd term the treasurer. So, so, so he could have raised it on the first occasion and the second occasion? Well, it would have come up in the... In oh, the look, I'm not interested in what would have happened. I'm interested in what did happen. Please uh, just give the evidence in that matter. What did happen? Did he raise it on the first occasion and the second occasion? On either occasion? He would have raised it on one of them. You say he did raise it on yes. one of those occasions? Yes. And on the third occasion, that gave rise to your speaking to Baldwin on the third occasion about his contact with ALA, who was it who raised it with you then, leading to the third I can't remember. Was it the same people, the same group of people? Were any one or many of those people? I, I would... <laughs> I said I can't remember. Is that because you were on some sort of mind-altering substances at the time? Were you suffering from some sort of ailment that was requiring you to take medication? I was on three morphine tablets a day. Yes, well, I read that in your statement. So at the, at the time of the third state, the, the time of the third intervention where you spoke to Baldwin about his contact with ALA, you were on some sort of heavy medication? Yes, and I would have... I was on um, three morphine tablets a day for about a year and a half until my surgery in February 2005. And you think that that may have, uh, therefore, in some way impeded your memory about the complaint that was registered with you leading to your speaking to Baldwin on the third occasion? 
I can only say that I was totally exhausted most days of the week. And if has, I, ha, has it, therefore, do you say, affected your memory of that complaint? Yes, there would probably be blanks there, yes. And you say you can't recall being spoken to by Ms. Ms. Wood, uh, Lockwood? No. Ms. Lockwood. But I expect that you'd agree that it could have been the case. You were spoken by Miss Lockwood, but you were on heavy medication, can't recall. Is that right? That could be a possibility. I can only tell you that I can't remember. Yep. You told counsel assisting in this Royal Commission that one of the conversations you had with Baldwin at the very, at the very outset was it was an open door policy. Mm -hmm. He was to keep his door open at all times. Mm -hmm. And I, I noticed that that didn't emerge in your statement to the Royal Commission. It's not in there, is it? No. But you volunteered that at the commencement of your evidence this afternoon uh, because you knew that one of the things Ms Lockwood has told the police about and given a statement indeed to this commission about is that there had been an accusation that Baldwin had locked himself in the office after a sleepover or during a sleepover at the church with ALA. Is that why you volunteered that no. tidbit of information? No. You see, I suggest, sir, that you were told by Lockwood that there was this event in around April of 2004, wherein Baldwin had locked himself and ALA in his office during a sleepover at the church. You were told that by Lockwood, weren't you? No, because it wouldn't have happened in April 2004. Are you saying there was no sleepover at the church in April of 2004? No. Abouts? No. There was not? No. He'd only just begun his ministry. Was there a sleepover subsequently? As I've indicated, oral tradition that was communicated to me much later says there was one, but I, I, I know it wouldn't have been in April 2004. And... Did Tom Liu talk to you about an occasion where Baldwin had locked the door with him and himself in the in in the office with with uh, with the door locked? No. If if Tom had concerns, he would have raised it at an eldership or director's level. He wouldn't. He would have. He, he, he would have done that. I expect you say yes. Uh, but you can't recall if he did or didn't. If it had. If it had been discussed at eldership, action would have been taken. So you assume, therefore, because action wasn't taken, that he didn't raise it? At eldership, that's right. Did he raise it on, the, on another occasion? I have no recollection of him personally talking to me about it. This could have been because of the morphine treatment that you're under as a result of the third hip replacement. The, the hip replacement. Is that right? Well, my, my <coughs> left hip was bone on bone. And so even if I sat in a seat like I'm sitting now, I couldn't just get up. My bones would lock, and so I had to disengage them. And by the and so normally a morphine tablet would last for about six or seven hours. And it could have been during that period of time, that six or seven hours, that the information was relayed to you about the, the sleepover and the, the locked office door. Is that right? No, I would have, we would have acted on that. Well, not if you couldn't remember it. Well, if you seriously doped up on morphine, you can't recall it. No. Yeah. So it could have happened then. No. And I suggest to you that Miss Lockwood, as she said to this commission, not only spoke to you about her concerns in relation to old Baldwin and ALA being in close connection with each other, 
but that they were inappropriately touching each other. I just object as to form. I don't think it's correct to say that she has said that to the Commission. I understand the evidence is an email from um, the first witness today, rather than, unless it's been provided in the form of a statement, which I don't have. It hasn't. No. I think it's an email to my friend's client that is before the Commission, not a statement from Ms Lockwood at this point. So it's just an objection as to form. Well, it's, it's, it's rather pedantic, one, Your Honour. It's, it, it's a statement to whom it may concern, signed and dated by Ms Lockwood. I mean, I can put it that way if it's preferred. Thanks, Your Honour. You see, Ms Lockwood has said in a statement which is tendered in these proceedings that she raised concerns with you about your locking, uh, sorry, Baldwin locking himself and ALA in his office and refusing to answer the door on several occasions. Do you accept that? I have no knowledge of that. That could have... That, that is, you can't recall that. We would have acted in response to that. Can you recall that or not? No. Baldwin inappropriately touching ALA? No, because at another point in 2005, ALA accused another adult of, a, in a, of putting his hand on his knee at Sunday worship, and we dealt with that one the next day. And Baldwin texting the child? You can't recall Lockwood telling you that? No. I don't send many texts on my mobile phone, but I know young adults text each other all the time. You don't recall hearing a complaint about it? That's no, the point. No, no. And th 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 that might be that it happened, but you just don't remember it happening. Is that, is that what you're saying? No. You're saying it didn't happen? Didn't happen. And she says in this statement that you brush these concerns off and disregarded them. That didn't happen. And that she had raised the concerns in a vehement way, according to this document. No. Nonetheless, you accept that people had on at least three occasions, and possibly a number of different people raised concerns about the relationship between ALA and Baldwin. But I never believed anything deviant was happening. You accepted that, and you raised the concerns on the first and second occasion, and yet the complaints came back again, didn't they? I, I said there was that there were three occasions, yes. And do you accept now that it was extremely naive on your part not to have investigated further or spoken to ALA? I would say two things. He was in a relationship with my daughter and that may have blindsided me to a degree because I would never have allowed my daughter to have a relationship with somebody if I thought that he was engaging in alternate sexual activity. You're, Se you, you, you're blind to the possibility, in other words, that it may be something untoward. I would never have thought it. Notwithstanding the complaints and the repetitive nature of them from several sources. It was what Johnny was doing was a model that he'd inherited from from Southside. It's how he had been mentored himself, and I could appreciate appreciate that his it was intense. But I never, in my wildest dreams, thought anything other. You were naive, and you were you were blinded by your feelings towards this man 
and the hope that he's a good husband potentially for your daughter. Is that, is that the case? I didn't have feelings towards him. I, I just did not believe that anything like that would happen. Did you ever speak to ALA about any of these things? No. Did you ever speak to ALA's parents about any of the concerns that have been raised by these various people on these numerous occasions? No. Do you think in hindsight that might have been a sensible thing to have done? ALA's parents often referred, asked Johnny to come round and counsel ALA. He, he would share that with me. Um, so my belief would have been that if they had concerns about the relationship, they would have expressed them to me. Yeah, but other people had within the church expressed concerns about the relationship to you, did you not think it therefore appropriate that you might express that to the parents or to ALA himself? No, I didn't do that. And then, in hindsight, do you think that was foolish? When we look backwards, we could always say we could have done things differently. Well, that's something you would have done differently, surely. Yes, in, but that's why I say, in the light of events that emerged two years later, we can always go back and say, we, I should have done something different there. Do you, today accept the guilt of Jonathan Baldwin of the ten counts which he was convicted and no, I struggle. sentenced? I struggle. I struggle, I said. You struggle to accept his guilt? T totally, yes. I'm not saying he didn't, he didn't make errors of judgement. But I have two grandsons by him, a third one about to be born. If I believe he is a pedophile, then I've got to face the reality that our three grandsons are at great risk. So even today, when you give evidence at this Royal Commission on oath, you do not accept that your son-in-law is a pedophile, notwithstanding his convictions and his subsequent unsuccessful appeals? No, I would not view him that way. I've got to, I have to say that. When I sit down and have a meal with him, share a bottle of red wine with him, I don't think I'm doing this with a pedophile. And you struggle to accept, therefore, that when these things were said to have happened, that they did, in fact, occur. I've read a portion of the transcript whenever it became available in 2008. I read a portion. I haven't read the whole transcript. But the man I know and what is there, I have difficulty reconciling. So do you think, sir, that when people started airing complaints against Baldwin from 2004 onwards, that you just were too blind to see what was obviously occurring. If even now you can't accept his guilt. I find paedophilia repulsive. I find homosexuality repulsive. And yet I have to, I've had to learn to work with some people who are openly homosexual. But I, it's something that I was once known as a homophobe. Um, people would have called me a homophobe. Um, so I, I find it repulsive, but all I'm saying is when I, when I sit down with Johnny and Amanda and our two grandsons and we meet as a family with them, at some point for the... Of course, I'm, I'm sensitive. My wife knows that if I smelt anything, I would be the first one to take him to the police station. I wouldn't even ask any questions. I would report him immediately. But 
when I am with them and I'm, we're relating as a family unit, um, I, I don't see him that way. You know that the way that the church was preparing to defend these matters against ALA's civil suit was to deny a level of corporate knowledge, as it were. Did you know that? No, I had, I had no communication from the um, anybody at all. Had you spoken to the lawyers for the insurance companies, the insurance company for the church? You had not? No. no. Oh, you mean, had I... Um, sorry, what, what, what's your question? Had I spoken to the lawyers of the insurance company since the charges were laid? Yes. No. Pending the civil... Uh, after, the, after there was... After the conviction, you know that there was a civil action taken by ALA against the church. I was only informed in the last 48 hours of the... Uh, payment that ALA received and the process that had been gone through. Were you aware that there was a process of engagement of lawyers by ALA from 2009 through till 2012 taking a suit, a civil suit against the church? No. You weren't aware of that at all? No. All I know is that Johnny told me that he was asked to pay 50000 and he and Amanda both declared bankrupt and that was the only part of the process that I was aware of. So in preparation for that civil suit, the, you're saying that the lawyers for the insurance companies or the lawyers, the lawyers for the Sunshine Church never got in touch with you? No. I've only been interviewed by two people, a female detective at the particular place on the Sunshine Coast and um, by David Kritikos. Nobody else has interviewed me. Nothing further, thanks. I'll go next, thank you. Yes, Mr Chowdhury. Uh, sir, my name's Craig Chowdhury. I act for Australian Christian Churches. Uh, I understand from the evidence you've just recently given that your daughter reconciled with Baldwin? Yes. Right. And they're having just about to have another baby? Or they had another baby? No, no. The, they have two sons right now. Yes. And the third son will be born in January. Right. All right. Now, you said a little while ago that... Uh, Baldwin told you that he had surrendered his credentials. He told me that in the last fortnight. I, I knew nothing. I'd never had, the, had that conversation with him, but he indicated that to me in the last fortnight. All right. Did he tell you when he had surrendered his credentials with the uh, Assemblies of God, Australian Christian Churches? Maya, what I understood from the conversation that he had with me in the last fortnight is that when the charges were laid, he then surrendered his credential. Right. Do you tell you who he surrendered his credentials to? No, he he mentioned a pastor's name on the Sunshine Coast, but I don't know whether he surrendered them to him or whether he posted it to the state or whatever. I, I don't know. Right. And the credentials, uh, he was referring to a card that people had. Was that what he was referring to? My understanding was he was referring to his PMC. Right. OK. Can you just, for the record, explain what that is? Probationary Minister's Credential, or which would have been um, awarded by the, the district that he was in. And it was a card or document, wasn't it? That's right. I, I had an IMC card, so he would have had a PMC card. And that was a card that you could... The one you had was something you could present, for example, at a hospital... That's right. ..to yes. say that you're going yes, to... So that's what I understood would, would have been the card, yes. All right. Thank you. I just want to take you to paragraph 7 of your statement. If that could be brought up, please.
Do you see that there? The sexual impropriety that's referred to there, was that involving children? No. It was... What did that involve? It was two to three young ladies over the age of 18. Um, I didn't, don't need to know the details. OK. But it didn't involve children. No, no. The sexual impropriety was with uh, women over the age of 18. Yes. All right. Thank you. Now, in your time as a pastor credentialed with the Assemblies of God, uh, you would have... Uh, been to training sessions with them, wouldn't you? I went to conferences, yes. Right. Uh, and how often did you go to conferences? Let's say from 2000, when you started at the Sunshine Coast Church. Well, I would have gone to their annual conference. Do you recall now any policies, I'll come to some specific ones in a minute, but any policies being discussed and adopted at those conferences you attended? No. Do you recall any policies in respect of child safety being discussed at any conference you attended? No. But Were you aware of child safety policies uh, issued by both the state executive that is in Queensland, and also the National Executive. Not that I personally read and studied, no. Right. Did you have copies of uh, policies of the State Executive in your office at the church? They would have probably been in my pastoral assistant's office, yes. Right. Well, did you ever read them? Not that I can recollect. Well, I said I didn't sit down and study them, no. Didn't you think that was part of your duties as senior pastor of the church to study the policies of the movement and understand them? That would have been an expectation, yes. But you didn't do it? No, I didn't read the manual from go to work. Well, did you read any of it? Probably I didn't, no. So... Uh... In the light of that, if the witness could be shown, please, it's in the policies bundle, tab 48. This was uh, first uh, promulgated in June 1994. Just take a moment to read it. And just read the first few paragraphs. Yes. Have you seen this before? I haven't specifically read that, no. All right. Uh, the minister's manual you had uh, was the Queensland minister's manual issued by the state executive. Are you aware of that? Right. I would have had it, yes. All right. Uh, but in any event... Uh, well, I wonder if uh, Mr Chaudhry could clarify that particular issue. I thought that this witness has said, as he has a number of times, I would have had it, yes. And we know that the policies are in a different office and he said he had not read them. Perhaps that uh, particular matter might be clarified by Mr Chowdhury. All right. 
you said that there was the minister's manual that was in the assistant pastor's office, correct? Mm -hmm. You have to speak your answer, I'm sorry, sir. Yes. But you said to me that despite you knew of its existence, you didn't read it. Is that correct? Oh, I didn't read it yeah, from page one to page to the end of it, no. Right. And I asked you previously, had you read any of it? I cannot remember a specific time when I sat down and read the manual. Uh, at the time, the concerns were being brought to you by other staff at the church about Baldwin's relationship with ALA. Did you think to yourself, I wonder if the church has got some policies on this, I should go have a look at the manual? No, I didn't think that way. All right. And as you've already said, it didn't occur to you, look, I might seek advice from the state executive or another senior pastor in the region about how I should deal with this. No. That's correct? That's right. Yes, I know. Mr Taylor. No, thank you. Mr Koenig. Thank you. You were just <clears throat> asked some questions. Sorry, I'm, as you know, your lawyer. My name's Aaron Koenig, and for those listening, you were just asked some questions in relation to um, not reading the manual. The document that you were just shown on the screen related to a period of time uh, before you became the pastor at the church. Is that right? The one that was just on the screen, yes. I understood that was 1996. When you went to work there, you'll see there at the top of the page, oh, 94. 1994. Yep. When you went to work there at the church, was that the first time that you'd worked in that capacity within the Assemblies of God? Yes. Uh, what training did you have in relation to the manual that you've just been asked questions about? None. Do you tell the Commission that the Assemblies of God didn't teach you about what was in the manual? If you're asking, did I go through an orientation program where I was specifically sat down and walked through the manual and had all, let's say, the different um, compartments explained to me? No, that never happened. Did you ever attend any form of training in which you were taught how to apply the protocols of the Assemblies of God? No. And did that continue to be the case during the time that you were at the church? Yes, there was no, there was no, what you're talking about, protocol training, no. You were asked a question about attending conferences during your time at the church and uh, your knowledge of new policies being announced at those conferences. Do you remember that question? Yes. Do you recall during the time that you were at the church any policy in relation to child protection being announced? No, but no. Towards the end of your time at the church, as you were about to leave, do you recall any development in relation to child protection? If it's a reference to the document that has January 2006 on it, no, I'd never seen that till today. You're referring to the child abuse document that Council Assisting showed yes. you earlier? Yes, yes. You say you've not seen that until today. I have today. not seen it until it was shown to me today. <clears throat> um, you asked a question about not approaching uh, senior pastors in the region or other persons senior to yourself within the assembly for advice about the issues you were confronting during your time at the church. When you needed advice, what was your practice? Well, when I... As I indicated, when I initially moved to the church and I had a challenge, um, I was really thrown back on our own resources. When you say you were thrown back on our own resources, you're referring to the resources of, the, of your church. Mm -hmm. And by that, do you include the people you worked with? Yes. Did you seek advice from time to time about 
operational matters from your board? Yes. And did that include, from time to time, dealing with issues concerning child protection? Yes. Is an example of that a case involving the person who had confessed to you sexual impropriety towards a juvenile? Are we talking about a person called Peter? Yes. Yes. And when about did that occur? It would have been in 2004. And do you say that you sought advice from your board as to what to do? Yes. And did they give you advice? Yes, we agreed on a process because I couldn't undertake the process if they were not supportive. And did that process lead to you uh, ultimately taking that person named Peter to the police? Yes. Well, it, it, it led to me recommending I'm going to take you to the police. Did he ultimately go to the police? Yes, but with, under his lawyer, not, not me physically taking him. And was that person ultimately dealt with by the law? Yes, I attended his sentence, sentencing hearing. He was sentenced to jail? Yes. And was that in relation to the sexual impropriety that he had confessed to you? Yes. And that was during the period of 2004? Yes. And at that time, who were the members of your board? In 2004, it would have been um, Tom Liu, um, David Baldwin, um, Alan Peake, uh, myself. And I'm just trying to check whether Paul Haddon would have been on the board then. You refer to a person by the name of David Baldwin? Yes. Is he in relation to um, John Baldwin? That's Johnny's father. He had become a member of the board, had he? After he moved up here. Do you remember what year he'd become a member of the board? It would have had to have either been late 2004 or early 2005. Was he still a member of the board when you uh, resigned from your position at the church? Now, we're talking June 2006. That's correct. He may not have been at that point. Thank you. Um, by June 2006, uh, you resigned, but that decision had been some time in coming. Is that correct? Yes. And is it the case that prior to that period of time, that is, for the first half of 2006, you were fulfilling your usual responsibilities as the senior pastor? No. Who was? Uh, Chris Peterson. And before 2006, that is in 2005, you had an operation on your hips? In, in um, February and then late May. There were two procedures? Two separate procedures. And you've given evidence or you've been asked questions about uh, medical or medication that you were on during that period of time. Well, it was in the time leading up to that surgery, yes, and during you, it. You, you mentioned in your evidence that you were on, uh, or you were under that medical regime for a year and a half before the surgery, is that correct? Yes. So the medical regime that you speak of is the consumption of uh, morphine tablets, is that correct? Yes. And you say that that was the case, that you were taking that, those tablets for a year and a half before your medical procedures in 2005? Yes. Your memory loss that you've given evidence of, or your, the blanks in your memory, are those blanks that continued throughout 2005 after your medical procedures? I recognised um, at the... It would have been about September 2005 that I um, dispensed with all medication. I had checked with my doctor and he said since the, if the morphine was addressing physical pain, there would be no addictive um, issues. And so I, I, I ceased taking all the medication and over a period of two years, um, I recognised increased clarity all the time in my thought processes. Throughout 2005, were you acting to your usual capacity as the senior pastor of the church? Yes. Does that include when you were having your medical procedures? 
Well, I was I was still the senior pastor, but I wasn't physically there. Right. Well, I'll put it another way. Were you fulfilling your usual duties as senior pastor? No, I couldn't. Who was? At that point, um, Johnny would have looked after some of the um, worship um, component. We, I'm, I'm only, we must have had a list of speakers that that come in at that point, and day to day, my daughter Mandy was the PA there, and she would have um, consulted me if there were issues she couldn't didn't know how to address. So when you were undergoing your medical treatment throughout 2005, the early part of 2005, who was in charge? You. Yes, in a de facto sense, yes. And in a direct sense, who was on site to be in charge of the day-to-day -day operations? Your daughter. Well, Mandy and Johnny would have been there. Tom Lou would have been there. He had an office downstairs that he used. And his business manager would have stepped in on any financial issues and addressed them. And uh, Pastor Peterson that you referred to before taking over in 2006, is that when he arrived on the scene in 2006? Um, he, we had had contact contact for about two and a half years before that, and he came to the church and spoke, and would sometimes spend three to four days in the church. I'll just stop you there. I'm asking you, when did he come on the scene in the church? You mean when did he formally assume responsibility? Did he take up responsibilities in 2005? No, took up responsibility at the beginning of 2006. Did he fulfil any pastoral care function in 2005? Not on a... No, not on a continuing basis at all, no. On any basis? He mediated between Johnny and I at one stage when um, I, I, I was working through my sense of betrayal by Johnny. Um, he did... Um, when he visited the church, um, he had the opportunity... The staff had the opportunity to meet with him. Did you during the period of time that you were affected by your medication, have any assistance in terms of the day-to-day -day running of the church? No. Was it known by your board that you had the difficulties you've described today because of your medication? I, I would have talked to them about it, yes. When you say you would have talked to, do you recall doing that or are you guessing that you did? No, they because when I rang them, when, when the first surgery was offered to me, I rang um, two of the eldership. One would have been Tom, and I said, "We we had a we had a flight flights were booked for me to Singapore in two weeks, and on that day they'd offered me surgery, and I said, guys, I, I need to know what you reckon I should do.' And they said, "Have the surgery done immediately," and so we will recognise will waive the cost of the flights and. Let's get the surgery done. There was a discussion with members of your board about the surgery. Had there been a discussion prior to that with members of the board that you recall today about the way that the medication affected you? Not a formal... Dis no, no. OK, no. Mr Kernigan, how much longer are you likely... I'm almost finished, Your Honour. No more than three minutes, if I can indicate right. that. Yes, I have one or two questions. Yeah, all right. Let's keep going. Thank you, Your Honour. You described in your evidence a feeling of exhaustion during the period of time that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. That is prior to your operation or post your operation? No, prior to my operation. You mentioned briefly that you would go home exhausted. I'd often just fall asleep. Is it the case that at this period of time that we're talking about prior to your operation... You had many opportunities to talk with Jonathan Baldwin? Just give me the question again, please. Is it the case that you had many opportunities prior to your operation to talk to Jonathan Baldwin? About concerns? About anything? We would have, we would have talked in the day-to-day... -day, uh, so daily? Well, he was in the office, so I didn't ignore him or anything like that, no. Did that communication extend beyond simply discussing day-to-day -day business to discussing the way that he was operating his business? 
he would have explained to me the youth program that he was unrolling. He would have shared what they were doing at specific Friday night events. If he was preaching, he would have indicated to me uh, what he was preaching about. And if there were other concerns that he had in terms of ministry or, or process, he would have discussed that with me. What is the level of your knowledge? Oh, sorry, I withdraw that. At the time that you were dealing with Jonathan Baldwin, what was your, how would you rate your expertise in regards to the issue of youth? Oh, I would have, I was never a youth pastor and youth ministry was never, it was my weakness. I just wanted to clarify something. And when you took over at uh, the Sunshine Coast Church, you said that uh, there was a youth pastor who was first of all engaged in allegations of sexual impropriety, and we went through that evidence. That's right, isn't it? Yes. And then there was um, a former senior pastor who'd been convicted of child sexual offences who wanted to come back to the congregation. Well, yeah, when, and, be, and yeah. be involved in it. We invited him back. Yes. Yes. And then you've just given evidence to my friend, Mr Kernigan, of a third man who you had referred to the police um, after he had admitted to you of child sexual abuse. He came to me initially and said that he was facing charges of, ex of exposing himself to a minor and the minor was his next door neighbour. All right, so it wasn't somebody in the church? No, it was in the community. Did you ask him whether he'd been engaged in any of that sort of behaviour with the congregation of which you were the head? Yes, he, he, it, was the, it was with his neighbour, but it was ne never on the church premises. All right. Did you ever raise those issues with members of the congregation to see whether there were any concerns um, about his behaviour with children in the congregation? I publicly shared with the church the charges that he was facing. And did anybody come forward to to mention that they were concerned about their own children? No. All right. And notwithstanding those two instances, namely the convicted sexual offender and this additional matter, did you take any steps at that stage to ensure that written child protection policies were in place at the church? No, I said earlier we had no written policies, no. Right. Yes. Those are my questions. Thanks, Mr Beckett. Um, Dr Lehman, can you just clarify for us what, um, what training, if any, you, you had from the time of your credentialing until the time you... Um, left the Assemblies of God, what training you had with respect to child protection and in particular the sexual abuse of children? I never attended a formal seminar. So is the answer no training? No training. At any time? And that would be, you're talking about the time I was a Lutheran pastor from 78 to um, uh, 98 and then transitioned in 2000. So, no, in the, all of that time, I had no formal training. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, did you... Uh, were you provided with the opportunity to attend uh, training or information sessions with respect to uh, the risk of sexual abuse of children, in particular in, in the context of the church? I, I was never aware of a seminar that was available. Um, when you left the Assemblies of God in 2006, I think it's June 2006, isn't it, when you leave? That's right. Um, what was the basis of that decision? 
um, towards the end of 2005, when the board became aware of the disaffection between my Johnny and Mandy and myself, it undermined confidence. And so at that point, uh, a process was put in place, or I helped facilitate a process where Chris Peterson became the apostle in the church in an apostolic network. Um, from January to June of 2006, um, my salary decreased. And so at the end of, or in June 2006, I left the church and planted a new church and took up other employment. Thank you. Anything arising out of that for A number of questions, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, go on, Mr Chowdhury. Uh, apart from the national conference, state conferences, there were also regional meetings, weren't there? District meetings, yes. District meetings. And uh, at the time you were at the Sunshine Coast Church, how many district meetings did you attend? I would have attended about 50% every year. Right. How many a year? I would have, well, probably between February and November meetings would have been held. And so I would have, I would have attended maybe four, five. Were, were meetings held monthly or half yearly? Can you just help us with that? No, I, on the Sunshine Coast, they were held monthly. Monthly? Monthly. Right. And I suggested the district meetings, uh, discussions about uh, policies of the movement were discussed. Do you accept that? Primarily the district meetings that I was at, it was more of a motivational speaker or a senior pastor from another area sharing around the Word of God um, for 50 minutes to an hour. And so at any district meeting you attended, was there any discussion about policies of the movement? No, I can't. I don't. Nothing comes to mind, no. And certainly not a discussion on the uh, child protection policies? No. Okay. You're aware that newsletters were sent around uh, from both the national executive and the state executive to pastors? Yes. And those newsletters uh, included, uh, didn't they, uh, opportunities for training? In the area of sexual... Uh, training in uh, a variety of matters, but in particular in respect of the policies of the movement. Do you recall that? No, I don't. You do recall receiving such newsletters? Oh, yes, I would have, my staff would have received the newsletters, yes. Okay. Were you ever encouraged at a district meeting to avail yourselves of policies, uh, sorry, of particular of training in the policies of the movement? No, not that I can remember. Now, if I just refer to policy tender bundle part three, and it's uh, tab 57. This is uh, Chapter 18 of the 2000 AOG Minister's Manual. You can go to the next page and just look at the opening page. Just let me know if you need time to read it, but do you recall ever reading this chapter? No. No? And if we go to tab 58, this is chapter 24 of the Minister's Manual, as at 2000. I object to this. I understand uh, this particular manual is 2010. Yes, but this, uh, I'm instructed that this was same chapter was enforced at 2000. Yes, that's not the uh, information that we've been provided with. Perhaps we can sort that out. Well, deal with it. Uh, we can sort that out. I'll just ask him a question. All right. Right. Uh, have you ever read that chapter or anything like that? No. Thank you. Right. 
Yeah, sorry about the delay. Thank you. Mm. Back to you, Mr. Beckett. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Lamont. Thank you for your attendance and your otherwise excuse. Thank you. We'll have um, Pastor Peterson is available for ten tomorrow, tomorrow morning. morning. Thank you.